Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Translated by F. P. Walter. Part 2, Chapter 4. The Red Sea. During the day of January 29th, the island of Ceylon disappeared below the horizon, and at a speed of twenty miles per hour, the Nautilus glided into the labyrinthine channels that separate the Maldive and Lacadive Islands. It likewise hugged Kilton Island, a shore of madreporic origin discovered by Vasco da Gama in 1499, and one of the nineteen chief islands in the group of the Lacadives, located between latitude 10 degrees and 14 degrees 30 minutes north, and between longitude 50 degrees 72 minutes and 69 degrees east. By then we had fared 16,220 miles, or 7,500 leagues, from our starting point in the seas of Japan. The next day, January 30th, when the Nautilus rose to the surface of the ocean, there was no more land in sight. Setting its course to the north-northwest, the ship headed toward the Gulf of Oman, carved out between Arabia and the Indian Peninsula, and providing access to the Persian Gulf. This was obviously a blind alley with no possible outlet. So where was Captain Nemo taking us? I was unable to say, which didn't satisfy the Canadian who that day asked me where we were going. We're going, Mr. Ned, where the captain's fancy takes us. His fancy, the Canadian replied, won't take us very far. The Persian Gulf has no outlet, and if we enter those waters, it won't be long before we return in our tracks. All right, we'll return, Mr. Land, and after the Persian Gulf, if the Nautilus wants to visit the Red Sea, the Strait of Bob el Mandeb is still there to let us in. I don't have to tell you, sir, Ned Land replied, that the Red Sea is just as landlocked as the Gulf, since the Isthmus of Suez hasn't been cut all the way through yet. And even if it was, a boat as secretive as ours wouldn't risk a canal intersected with locks, so the Red Sea won't be our way back to Europe either. But I didn't say we'd return to Europe. What do you figure, then? I figure that after visiting these unusual waterways of Arabia and Egypt, the Nautilus will go back down to the Indian Ocean, perhaps through Mozambique Channel, perhaps off the Mascarene Islands, and then make for the Cape of Good Hope. And once we're at the Cape of Good Hope, the Canadian asked with typical persistence, well, then, we'll enter the Atlantic Ocean, with which we aren't yet familiar. What's wrong, Ned, my friend? Are you still tired of this voyage under the seas? Are you bored with the constantly changing sight of these underwater wonders? Speaking for myself, I'll be extremely distressed to see the end of a voyage so few men will ever have a chance to make. But don't you realize, Professor Aronnax, the Canadian replied, that soon we'll have been imprisoned for three whole months aboard this Nautilus? No, Ned, I didn't realize it. I don't want to realize it, and I don't keep track of every day and every hour. But when will it be over? In its appointed time. Meanwhile, there's nothing we can do about it, and our discussions are futile. My gallant Ned, if you come and tell me a chance of escape is available to us, then I'll discuss it with you. But that isn't the case, and in all honesty, I don't think Captain Nemo ever ventures into European seas. This short dialogue reveals that in my mania for the Nautilus, I was turning into the spitting image of its commander. As for Ned Land, he ended our talk in his best speechifying style. That's all fine and dandy, but in my humble opinion, a life in jail is a life without joy. For four days, until February 3rd, the Nautilus inspected the Gulf of Oman at various speeds and depths. It seemed to be traveling at random, as if hesitating over which course to follow, but it never crossed the Tropic of Cancer. After leaving this gulf, we raised Muscat for an instant, the most important town in the country of Oman. I marveled at its strange appearance in the midst of the black rocks surrounding it, against which the white of its houses and forts stood out sharply. I spotted the rounded domes of its mosques, the elegant tips of its minarets, and its fresh leafy terraces. But it was only a fleeting vision, and the Nautilus soon sank beneath the dark waves of these waterways. Then our ship went along at a distance of six miles from the Arabian coast of Mara and Hadramaut, their undulating lines of mountains relieved by a few ancient ruins. On February 5th, we finally put into the Gulf of Aden, a genuine funnel stuck into the neck of Bob el Mandeb, and bottling these Indian waters in the Red Sea. On February 6th, the Nautilus cruised in sight of the city of Aden, perched on a promontory connected to the continent by a narrow isthmus, a sort of inaccessible Gibraltar whose fortifications the English rebuilt after capturing it in 1839. 
I glimpsed the octagonal minarets of this town, which used to be one of the wealthiest, busiest commercial centers along this coast, as the Arab historian Idrisi tells it. I was convinced that when Captain Nemo reached this point he would back out again, but I was mistaken, and much to my surprise, he did nothing of the sort. The next day, February 7th, we entered the Strait of Bab el Mandeb, whose name means Gate of Tears in the Arabic language. Twenty miles wide, it's only fifty-two kilometers long, and with the Nautilus launched at full speed, clearing it was the work of barely an hour. But I didn't see a thing, not even Parham Island, where the British government built fortifications to strengthen Aden's position. There were many English and French steamers plowing this narrow passageway, liners going from Suez to Bombay, Calcutta, Melbourne, Reunion Island, and Mauritius. Far too much traffic for the Nautilus to make an appearance on the surface, so it wisely stayed in mid-water. Finally, at noon, we were plowing the waves of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, that great lake so famous in biblical traditions, seldom replenished by rains, fed by no important rivers, continually drained by a high rate of evaporation, its water level dropping a meter and a half every year. If it were fully landlocked like a lake, this odd gulf might dry up completely. On this score, it's inferior to its neighbors, the Caspian Sea and the Dead Sea, whose levels lower only to the point where their evaporation exactly equals the amounts of water they take to their hearts. This Red Sea is 2,600 kilometers long, with an average width of 240. In the days of the Ptolemies and the Roman emperors, it was a great commercial artery for the world, and when its isthmus has been cut through, it will completely regain that bygone importance that the Suez railways have already brought back in part. I would not even attempt to understand the whim that induced Captain Nemo to take us into this gulf, but I wholeheartedly approved of the Nautilus's entering it. It adopted a medium pace, sometimes staying on the surface, sometimes diving to avoid some ship, and so I could observe both the inside and the top side of this highly unusual sea. On February 8th, as early as the first hours of daylight, Mocha appeared before us, a town now in ruins, whose walls would collapse at the mere sound of a cannon, and which shelters a few leafy date trees here and there. This once important city used to contain six public market places, plus twenty-six mosques, and its walls, protected by fourteen forts, fashioned a three-kilometer girdle around it. Then the Nautilus drew near the beaches of Africa, where the sea is considerably deeper. There, through the open panels, and in a mid-water of crystal clarity, our ship enabled us to study wonderful bushes of shining coral and huge chunks of rock wrapped in splendid green furs of algae and fucus. What an indescribable sight, and what a variety of settings and scenery were these reefs and volcanic islands leveled off by the Libyan coast. But soon the Nautilus hugged the eastern shore, where these tree forms appear in all their glory. This was off the coast of Tihama, and there, such zoophyte displays not only flourished below sea level, but they also fashioned picturesque networks that unreeled as high as ten fathoms above it. The latter were more whimsical, but less colorful than the former, which kept their blooms thanks to the moist vitality of the waters. How many delightful hours I spent in this way at the lounge window! How many new specimens of underwater flora and fauna I marveled at beneath the light of our electric beacon. Mushroom-shaped fungus coral, some slate-colored sea anemone including the species Thalassianthus aster, among others. Organ-pipe coral arranged like flutes and just begging for a puff from the god Pan. Shells unique to this sea that dwell in madreporic cavities and whose bases are twisted into squat spirals, and finally a thousand samples of a polypary I hadn't observed until then, the common sponge. The class Spongiaria has been created by scientists precisely for this unusual exhibit whose usefulness is beyond dispute. The sponge is definitely not a plant, as some naturalists still believe, but an animal of the lowest order, a polypary inferior even to coral. Its animal nature isn't in doubt, and we can't accept even the view of the ancients who regarded it as halfway between plant and animal, but I must say that naturalists are not in agreement on the structural mode of sponges. For some, it's a polypary, and for others, such as Professor Milne Edwards, it's a single, solitary individual. The class Spongiaria contains about 300 species that are encountered in a large number of seas, and even in certain streams, where they've been given the name freshwater sponges. But their waters of choice are the Red Sea and the Mediterranean near the Greek islands or the coast of Syria. These waters witness the reproduction and growth of soft, delicate bath sponges whose prices run as high as 150 francs apiece. 
the yellow sponge from Syria, the horn sponge from Barbary, etc. But since I had no hope of studying these zoophytes in the seaports of the Levant, from which we were separated by the insuperable isthmus of Suez, I had to be content with observing them in the waters of the Red Sea. So I called Conseil to my side, while at an average depth of eight to nine meters the Nautilus slowly skimmed every beautiful rock on the easterly coast. There, sponges grew in every shape, globular, star-like, leaf-like, finger-like. With reasonable accuracy, they lived up to their nicknames of basket sponges, chalice sponges, distaff sponges, elkhorn sponges, lion's paws, peacock's tails, and Neptune's gloves, designations bestowed on them by fishermen more poetically inclined than scientists. A gelatinous, semi-fluid substance coated the fibrous tissue of these sponges, and from this tissue there escaped a steady trickle of water that, after carrying sustenance to each cell, was expelled by a contracting movement. This jelly-like substance disappears when the polyp dies, emitting ammonia as it rots. Finally, nothing remains but the fibers, either gelatinous or made of horn, that constitute your household sponge, which takes on a russet hue and is used for various tasks depending upon its degree of elasticity, permeability, or resistance to saturation. These polyparies were sticking to rocks, shells of mollusks, and even the stalks of water plants. They adorned the smallest crevices, some sprawling, others standing or hanging like coral outgrowths. I told Conseil that sponges are fished up in two ways, either by dragnet or by hand. The latter method calls for the services of a diver, but it's preferable because it spares the polyparies tissue, leaving it with a much higher market value. Other zoophytes swarming near the sponges consisted chiefly of a very elegant species of jellyfish. Mollusks were represented by varieties of squid that, according to Professor Orbigny, are unique to the Red Sea, and reptiles by the Vergata turtles belonging to the genus Chelonia, which furnished our table with a dainty but wholesome dish. As for fish, they were numerous and often remarkable. Here are the ones the Nautilus's nets most frequently hauled on board. Rays, including spotted rays that were oval in shape and brick-red in color, their bodies strewn with erratic blue speckles and identifiable by their jagged double stings, silver-backed skates, common stingrays with stippled tails, butterfly rays that looked like huge two-meter cloaks flapping at mid-depth, toothless guitarfish that were a type of cartilaginous fish closer to the shark, trunkfish known as dromedaries that were one and a half feet long and had humps ending in backward-curving stings, serpentine moray eels with silver tails and bluish backs plus brown pectorals trimmed in gray piping a species of butterfish called the fiatola decked out in thin gold stripes and the three colors of the french flag montague blennies four decimeters long superb jacks handsomely embellished by seven black crosswise streaks with blue and yellow fins plus gold and silver scales snooks standard mullet with yellow heads parrotfish wrasse tigerfish gobies, etc., plus a thousand other fish common to the oceans we had already crossed. On February 9th, the Nautilus cruised in the widest part of the Red Sea, measuring 190 miles straight across from Sakin on the west coast to Kunfida on the east coast. At noon, that day after our position fix, Captain Nemo climbed onto the platform where I happened to be. I vowed not to let him go below again without at least sounding him out on his future plans. As soon as he saw me, he came over, graciously offered me a cigar, and said to me, Well, Professor, are you pleased with this Red Sea? Have you seen enough of its hidden wonders, its fish and zoophytes, its garden of sponges and forests of coral? Have you glimpsed the towns built on its shores? Yes, Captain Nemo, I replied, and the Nautilus is wonderfully suited to this whole survey. Ah, it's a clever boat. Yes, sir, clever and daring, and invulnerable. It fears neither the Red Sea's dreadful storms nor its currents and reefs. Indeed, I said, this sea is mentioned as one of the worst, and in the days of the ancients, if I'm not mistaken, it had an abominable reputation. Thoroughly abominable, Professor Aronnax. The Greek and Latin historians can find nothing to say in its favor, and the Greek geographer Strabo adds it's especially rough during the rainy season and the period of summer prevailing winds. The Arab Adrisi, referring to it by the name of Gulf of Kolzum, relates that ships perished in large numbers on its sandbanks, and that no one risked navigating it by night. This, he claims, is a sea subject to fearful hurricanes, strewn with inhospitable islands, and with nothing good to offer, either on its surface or in its depths. As a matter of fact, the same views can also be found in Arian, Agatharchides, and Artemidurus. One can easily see, I answered, 
that those historians didn't navigate aboard the Nautilus. Indeed, the captain replied with a smile, and in this respect the moderns aren't much further along than the ancients. It took many centuries to discover the mechanical power of steam. Who knows whether we'll see a second Nautilus within the next hundred years. Progress is slow, Professor Aronnax. It's true, I replied. Your ship is a century ahead of its time, perhaps several centuries. It would be most unfortunate if such a secret were to die with its inventor. Captain Nemo did not reply. After some minutes of silence, we were discussing, he said, the views of ancient historians on the dangers of navigating the Red Sea. True, I replied. But weren't their fears exaggerated? Yes and no, Professor Aronnax, answered Captain Nemo, who seemed to know his Red Sea by heart. To a modern ship, well-rigged, solidly constructed, and in control of its course, thanks to obedient steam, some conditions are no longer hazardous that offered all sorts of dangers to the vessels of the ancients. Picture those early navigators venturing forth in sailboats, built from planks lashed together with palm-tree ropes, caulked with powdered resin, and coated with dogfish grease. They didn't even have instruments for taking their bearings. They went by guesswork in the midst of currents they barely knew. Under such conditions, shipwrecks had to be numerous. But nowadays, steamers providing service between Suez and the South Seas have nothing to fear from the fury of this gulf, despite the contrary winds of its monsoons. Their captains and passengers no longer prepare for departure with sacrifices to placate the gods. And after returning, they don't traipse in reeds and gold ribbons to say thanks at the local temple. Agreed, I said, and steam seems to have killed off all gratitude in seamen's hearts. But since you seem to have made a special study of this sea, Captain, can you tell me how it got its name? Many explanations exist on the subject, Professor Aronnax. Would you like to hear the views of one chronicler in the 14th century? Gladly. This fanciful fellow claims the sea was given its name after the crossing of the Israelites, when the Pharaoh perished in those waves that came together again at Moses' command. To mark that miraculous sequel, the sea turned red without equal. Thus no other course would do but to name it for its hue. An artistic explanation, Captain Nemo, I replied, but I am unable to rest content with it, so I'll ask you for your own personal views. Here they come. To my thinking, Professor Aronnax, this Red Sea designation must be regarded as a translation of the Hebrew word Edrum, and if the ancients gave it that name, it was because of the unique color of its waters. Until now, however, I've only seen clear waves without any unique hue. Surely. But as we move ahead to the far end of this gulf, you will notice its odd appearance. I recall seeing the Bay of El Tour completely red, like a lake of blood. And you attribute this color to the presence of microscopic algae? Yes, it's a purplish, mucilaginous substance produced by those tiny buds known by the name Trichodesmia, 40,000 of which are needed to occupy the space of one square millimeter. Perhaps you'll encounter them when we reach El Tour. Hence, Captain Nemo, this isn't the first time you've gone through the Red Sea aboard the Nautilus. No, sir. Then, since you've already mentioned the crossing of the Israelites and the catastrophe that befell the Egyptians, I would ask if you've ever discovered any traces under the waters of that great historic event. No, Professor, and for an excellent reason. What's that? It's because the same locality where Moses crossed with all his people is now so clogged with sand, camels can barely get their legs wet. You can understand that my Nautilus wouldn't have enough water for itself. And that locality is? I asked. That locality lies a little above Suez, in a sound that used to form a deep estuary when the Red Sea stretched as far as the Bitter Lakes. Now, whether or not their crossing was literally miraculous, the Israelites did cross there in returning to the Promised Land, and the Pharaoh's army did perish at precisely that locality so I think that excavating those sands would bring to light a great many weapons and tools of Egyptian origin. Obviously, I replied, and for the sake of archaeology, let's hope that sooner or later, such excavations do take place. Once new towns are settled on the isthmus after the Suez Canal has been cut through, a canal, by the way, of little use to a ship such as the Nautilus. Surely, but of great use to the world at large, Captain Nemo said, the ancients well understood the usefulness to commerce of connecting the Red Sea with the Mediterranean, but they never dreamed of cutting a canal between the two. Instead, they picked the Nile as their link. If we can trust tradition, it was probably Egypt's king Sestostris who started digging the canal needed to join the Nile with the Red Sea. What's certain is that by 615 BC, King Necho II was hard at work on a canal that was fed by Nile water and ran through the Egyptian plains opposite Arabia. This canal could be traveled in four days, and it was so wide 
two triple-tiered galleys could pass through it abreast. Its construction was continued by Darius the Great, son of Hystaspes, and probably completed by King Ptolemy the Second. Strabo saw it used for shipping, but the weakness of its slope between its starting point near Bubastis and the Red Sea left it navigable only a few months out of the year. This canal served commerce until the century of Rome's Antonine emperors. It was then abandoned and covered with sand, subsequently reinstated by Arabia's Caliph Omar I, and finally filled in for good in 761 or 762 AD by Caliph al-Mansur, in an effort to prevent supplies from reaching Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who had rebelled against him. During his Egyptian campaign, your general Napoleon Bonaparte discovered traces of this old canal in the Suez Desert, and when the tide caught him by surprise, he well-nigh perished just a few hours before rejoining his regiment at Hajaroth, the very place where Moses had pitched camp 3,300 years before him. Well, Captain, what the ancients hesitated to undertake, Mr. de Lesseps is now finishing up. His joining of these two seas will shorten the route from Cadiz to the East Indies by 9,000 kilometers, and he'll soon change Africa into an immense island. Yes, Professor Aronnax, and you have every right to be proud of your fellow countrymen. Such a man brings a nation more honor than the greatest commanders. Like so many others, he began with difficulties and setbacks, but he triumphed because he has the volunteer spirit. And it's sad to think that this deed, which should have been international indeed, which would have ensured that any administration went down in history, will succeed only through the efforts of one man. So all hail to Mr. de Lesseps. Yes, all hail to that great French citizen, I replied, quite startled by how emphatically Captain Nemo had just spoken. Unfortunately, he went on, I can't take you through that Suez Canal, but the day after tomorrow you'll be able to see the long jetties of Port Said when we're in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean, I exclaimed. Yes, Professor, does that amaze you? What amazes me is thinking that we'll be there the day after tomorrow. Oh, really? Yes, Captain, although, since I've been aboard your vessel, I should have formed the habit of not being amazed by anything. But what is it that startles you? The thought of how hideously fast the Nautilus will need to go if we'll double the Cape of Good Hope, circle around Africa, and lie in the open Mediterranean by the day after tomorrow. And who says it will circle Africa, Professor? What is this talk of doubling the Cape of Good Hope? But unless the Nautilus navigates on dry land and crosses over the Isthmus, or under it, Professor Aronnax. Under it? Surely, Captain Nemo replied sternly. Under that tongue of land, nature long ago made what man today is making on its surface. What? There is a passageway? Yes, an underground passageway that I've named the Arabian Tunnel. It starts below Suez and leads to the Bay of Pelusium. But isn't that isthmus only composed of quicksand? To a certain depth, but at merely fifty meters one encounters a firm foundation of rock. And it's by luck that you discovered this passageway? I asked more and more startled. Luck plus logic, Professor and logic even more than luck. Captain, I hear you, but I can't believe my ears. Oh, sir, the old saying still holds. Aris habent et non audient. Latin. They have ears, but do not hear. Editor. Not only does this passageway exist, but I've taken advantage of it on several occasions. Without it, I wouldn't have ventured today into such a blind alley as the Red Sea. Is it indiscreet to ask how you discovered this tunnel? Sir, the captain answered me, there can be no secrets between men who will never leave each other. I ignored this innuendo and waited for Captain Nemo's explanation. Professor, he told me, the simple logic of the naturalist led me to discover this passageway, and I alone am familiar with it. I noted that in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean there exist a number of absolutely identical species of fish, eel, butterfish, greenfish, bass, jewelfish, flying fish. Certain of this fact, I wondered if there wasn't a connection between the two seas. If there were, its underground current had to go from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean simply because of their difference in level. So I caught a large number of fish in the vicinity of Suez. I slipped copper rings around their tails and tossed them back into the sea. A few months later off the coast of Syria, I recaptured a few specimens of my fish, adorned with their telltale rings. So this proved to me that some connection existed between the two seas. I searched for it with my Nautilus. I discovered it. I ventured into it, and soon, Professor, you also will have cleared my Arabic tunnel. End of Part 2, Chapter 4《Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne Part 2, 
Chapter 5 Arabian Tunnel The same day I reported to Conseil and Ned Land that part of the foregoing conversation directly concerning them. When I told them we would be lying in Mediterranean waters within two days, Conseil clapped his hands, but the Canadian shrugged his shoulders. An underwater tunnel, he exclaimed. A connection between two seas. Who ever heard such malarkey? Ned, my friend, Conseil replied. Had you ever heard of the Nautilus? No, yet here it is. So don't shrug your shoulders so blithely, and don't discount something with a feeble excuse that you've never heard of it. We'll soon see, Ned Land shot back, shaking his head. After all, I'd like nothing better than to believe in your captain's little passageway, and may heaven grant it really does take us to the Mediterranean. That same evening, at latitude 21 degrees 30 minutes north, the Nautilus was afloat on the surface of the sea and drawing nearer to the Arab coast. I spotted Jida, an important financial center for Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and the East Indies. I could distinguish with reasonable clarity the overall effect of its buildings, the ships made fast along its wharves, and those bigger vessels whose draft of water required them to drop anchor at the port's offshore mooring. The sun, fairly low on the horizon, struck full force on the houses in this town, accenting their whiteness. Outside the city limits, some wood or reed huts indicated the quarter where the Bedouins lived. Soon Jita faded into the shadows of evening, and the Nautilus went back beneath the mildly phosphorescent waters. The next day, February 10th, several ships appeared, running on our opposite tack. The Nautilus resumed its underwater navigating, but at the moment of our noon sights, the sea was deserted, and the ship rose again to its waterline. With Ned and Conseil, I sat on the platform. The coast to the east looked like a slightly blurred mass in a damp fog. Leaning against the sides of the skiff, we were chatting of one thing and another, when Ned Land stretched his hands toward a point in the water, saying to me, "'See anything out there, Professor?' "'No, Ned,' I replied. "'But you know I don't have your eyes.' "'Take a good look,' Ned went on. "'There, ahead to the starboard, almost level with the beacon. Don't you see a mass that seems to be moving around?' "'Right,' I said, after observing carefully. "'I can make out something like a long, blackish object on the surface of the water.' A second Nautilus, Conseil said. No, the Canadian replied. Unless I'm badly mistaken, that's some marine animal. Are there whales in the Red Sea? Conseil asked. Yes, my boy, I replied. They're sometimes found here. That's no whale, continued Ned Land, whose eyes never strayed from the object they had sighted. We're old chums, whales and I, and I couldn't mistake their little ways. Let's wait and see, Conseil said. The Nautilus is heading in that direction, and we'll soon know what we're in for. In fact, that blackish object was soon only a mile away from us. It looked like a huge reef stranded in mid-ocean. What was it? I still couldn't make up my mind. Oh, it's moving off! It's diving! Ned Land exclaimed. Damnation! What can that animal be? It doesn't have a forked tail like baleen whales or sperm whales, and its fins look like sawed-off limbs. But in that case, I put in... Good lord! The Canadian went on. It's rolled over on its back, and it's raising its breasts in the air! It's a siren, Conseil exclaimed. With all due respect to Master, it's an actual mermaid. The word siren put me back on track, and I realized that the animal belonged to the order Sirenia, marine creatures that legends have turned into mermaids, half woman, half fish. No, I told Conseil. That's no mermaid. It's an unusual creature of which only a few specimens are left in the Red Sea. That's a dugong. Order Sirenia. Group Pisiforma. Subclass? Monodelphia. Class, Mammalia. Branch, Vertebrata, Conseil replied. And when Conseil has spoken, there's nothing else to be said. Meanwhile, Ned Land kept staring. His eyes were gleaming with desire at the sight of that animal. His hands were ready to hurl a harpoon. You would have thought he was waiting for the right moment to jump overboard and attack the creature in its own element. Oh, sir, he told me in a voice trembling with excitement, I've never killed anything like that. His whole being was concentrated in this last word. Just then, Captain Nemo appeared on the platform. He spotted the dugong. He understood the Canadian's frame of mind and addressed him directly. If you held a harpoon, Mr. Land, wouldn't your hands be itching to put it to work? Positively, sir. And just for one day, would it displease you to return to your fisherman's trade and add this cetacean to the list of those you've already hunted down? It wouldn't displease me one bit. All right, you can try your luck. Thank you, sir. Ned Land replied, his eyes ablaze. Only, the captain went on, 
I urge you to aim carefully at this animal in your own personal interest. Is the dugong dangerous to attack? I asked, despite the Canadian's shrug of the shoulders. Yes, sometimes, the captain replied. These animals have been known to turn on their assailants and capsize their longboats, but with Mr. Land that danger isn't to be feared. His eye is sharp, his arm is sure. If I recommend that he aim carefully at this dugong, it's because the animal is justly regarded as fine game, and I know Mr. Land doesn't despise a choice morsel. Aha! the Canadian put in. This beast offers the added luxury of being good to eat? Yes, Mr. Land. Its flesh is actual red meat, highly prized and set aside throughout Malaysia for the tables of aristocrats. Accordingly, this excellent animal has been hunted so bloodthirstily that, like its manatee relatives, it has become more and more scarce. In that case, Captain, Conseil said in all seriousness, on the off chance that this creature might be the last of its line, wouldn't it be advisable to spare its life in the interests of science? Maybe, the Canadian answered, it would be better to hunt it down in the interests of mealtime. Then proceed, Mr. Land, Captain Nemo replied. Just then, as mute and emotionless as ever, seven crewmen climbed onto the platform. One carried a harpoon and line similar to those used in whale fishing. Its deck paneling opened, the skiff was wrenched from its socket and launched to the sea. Six rowers sat on the thwarts, and the coxswain took the tiller. Ned, Conseil, and I found seats in the stern. "'Aren't you coming, Captain?' I asked. "'No, sir, but I wish you happy hunting.' The skiff pulled clear. It headed swiftly toward the dugong, which by then was floating two miles from the Nautilus. Arriving within a few cable lengths of the cetacean, our longboat slowed down, and the skulls dipped noiselessly into the tranquil waters. Harpoon in hand, Ned Land went to take his stand in the skiff's bow. Harpoons used for hunting whales are usually attached to a very long rope that pays out quickly when the wounded animal drags it with him, but this rope measured no more than about ten fathoms, and its end had simply been fastened to a small barrel that, while floating, would indicate the dugong's movements beneath the waters. I stood up and could clearly observe the Canadian's adversary. This dugong, which also boasts the name Halicor, closely resembled a manatee. Its oblong body ended in a very long caudal fin, and its lateral fins in actual fingers. It differs from the manatee in that its upper jaw is armed with two long, pointed teeth that form diverging tusks on either side. This dugong that Ned Land was preparing to attack was of colossal dimensions, easily exceeding seven meters in length. It didn't stir and seemed to be sleeping on the surface of the waves, a circumstance that should have made it easier to capture. The skiff approached cautiously to within three fathoms of the animal. The oars hung suspended above their rowlocks. I was crouching. His body leaning slightly back, Ned Land brandished his harpoon with expert hands. Suddenly, a hissing sound was audible, and the dugong disappeared. Although the harpoon had been forcefully hurled, it apparently had hit only water. "'Damnation!' exclaimed the furious Canadian. "'I missed it!' "'No,' I said. "'The animal's wounded. There's its blood. But your weapon didn't stick in its body.' "'My harpoon! Get my harpoon!' Ned Land exclaimed. The sailors went back to their sculling, and the coxswain steered the longboat toward the floating barrel. We fished up the harpoon, and the skiff started off in pursuit of the animal. The latter returned from time to time to breathe at the surface of the sea. Its wound hadn't weakened it because it went with tremendous speed. Driven by energetic arms, the longboat flew on its trail. Several times we got within a few fathoms of it, and the Canadian hovered in readiness to strike, but then the dugong would steal away with a sudden dive, and it proved impossible to overtake the beast. I'll let you assess the degree of anger consuming our impatient Ned Land. He hurled at the hapless animal the most potent swear words in the English language. For my part, I was simply distressed to see this dugong outwit our every scheme. We chased it unflaggingly for a full hour, and I'd begun to think it would prove too difficult to capture when the animal got the untimely idea of taking revenge on us, a notion it would soon have cause to regret. It wheeled on the skiff to assault us in its turn. This maneuver did not escape the Canadian. Watch out, he said. The coxswain pronounced a few words in his bizarre language, and no doubt he alerted his men to keep on their guard. Arriving within twenty feet of the skiff, the dugong stopped, sharply sniffing the air with its huge nostrils, pierced not at the tip of its muzzle but on its top side. Then it gathered itself and sprang at us. The skiff couldn't avoid the collision. Half overturned, it shipped a ton or two of water that we had to bail out, but thanks to our skillful coxswain, we were fouled on the bias rather than broadside, so we didn't capsize. Clinging to the stem post, Ned Land thrust his harpoon again and again into the gigantic animal, which embedded its teeth into our gunwale and lifted the longboat out of the water as a lion would lift a deer. 
We were thrown on top of each other, and I have no idea how the venture would have ended had not the Canadian, still thirsting for the beast's blood, finally pierced it to the heart. I heard its teeth grind on sheet iron, and the dugong disappeared, taking our harpoon along with it. But the barrel soon popped up to the surface, and a few moments later the animal's body appeared and rolled over on its back. Our skiff rejoined it, took it in tow, and headed to the Nautilus. It took pulleys of great strength to hoist this dugong onto the platform. The beast weighed 5,000 kilograms. It was carved up in sight of the Canadian, who remained to watch every detail of the operation. At dinner the same day, my steward served me some slices of this flesh, skillfully dressed by the ship's cook. I found it excellent, even better than veal, if not beef. The next morning, February 11th, the Nautilus's pantry was enriched by more dainty game. A covey of terns alighted on the Nautilus. They were a species of Stona nilotica, unique to Egypt. Beak black, head gray and stippled, eyes surrounded by white dots, back, wings, and tail grayish, belly and throat white, feet red. Also caught were a couple dozen Nile duck, superior tasting wild fowl whose neck and crown of the head are white, speckled with black. By then, the Nautilus had reduced speed. It moved ahead at a saunter, so to speak. I observed that the Red Sea's water was becoming less salty the closer we got to Suez. Nearly five o'clock in the afternoon, we sighted Cape Ras Mohammed to the north. This cape forms the tip of Arabia Petraea, which lies beneath the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. The Nautilus entered the Strait of Jubal, which leads to the Gulf of Suez. I could clearly make out a high mountain crowning Ras Mohammed between the two gulfs. It was Mount Horeb, that biblical Mount Sinai on whose summits Moses met God face to face. That summit, the mind's eye always pictures as wreathed in lightning. At six o'clock, sometimes afloat and sometimes submerged, the Nautilus passed well out from El Tur, which sat at the far end of a bay whose waters seemed to be dyed red, as Captain Nemo had already mentioned. Then night fell in the midst of a heavy silence occasionally broken by the calls of pelicans and nocturnal birds, by the sound of surf chafing against rocks, or by the distant moan of a steamer churning the waves of the gulf with noisy blades. From eight to nine o'clock, the Nautilus stayed a few meters beneath the waters. According to my calculations, we had to be quite close to Suez. Through the panels in the lounge, I spotted rocky bottoms lit by our electric rays. It seemed to me that the strait was getting narrower and narrower. At 9.15, when our boat returned to the surface, I climbed onto the platform. I was quite impatient to clear Captain Nemo's tunnel, couldn't sit still, and wanted to breathe the fresh night air. Soon, in the shadows, I spotted a pale signal light glimmering a mile away, half discolored by mist. A floating lighthouse said someone next to me. I turned and discovered the captain. That's the floating signal light of Suez, he went on. It won't be long before we reach the entrance to the tunnel. It can't be very easy to enter it. No, sir. Accordingly, I'm in the habit of staying in the pilot house and directing maneuvers myself. And now, if you'll kindly go below, Professor Aronnax, the Nautilus is about to sink beneath the waves, and it will only return to the surface after we've cleared the Arabian Tunnel. I followed Captain Nemo. The hatch closed, the ballast tanks filled with water, and the submersible sank some ten meters down. Just as I was about to repair to my stateroom, the captain stopped me. Professor, he said to me, would you like to go with me to the wheelhouse? I was afraid to ask, I replied. Come along, then. This way, you'll learn the full story about this combination underwater and underground navigating. Captain Nemo led me to the central companionway. In mid-stair, he opened a door went along the upper gangways and arrived at the wheelhouse, which, as you know, stands at one end of the platform. It was a cabin measuring six feet square and closely resembling those occupied by the helmsmen of steamboats on the Mississippi or Hudson Rivers. In the center stood an upright wheel geared to rudder cables running to the Nautilus's stern. Set in the cabin's walls were four deadlights, windows of biconvex glass that enabled the man at the helm to see in every direction. The cabin was dark, but my eyes soon grew accustomed to its darkness and I saw the pilot, a muscular man whose hands rested on the pegs of the wheel. Outside, the sea was brightly lit by the beacon shining behind the cabin at the other end of the platform. Now, Captain Nemo said, let's look for our passageway. Electric wires linked the pilot house with the engine room, and from this cabin, the captain could simultaneously signal heading and speed to his Nautilus. He pressed a metal button and at once the propeller slowed down significantly. I stared in silence at the high, sheer wall we were skirting just then, the firm base of the sandy mountains on the coast. For an hour, we went along it in this fashion, staying only a few meters away. Captain Nemo never took his eyes off the two concentric circles of the compass hanging in the cabin. At a mere gesture from him, the helmsman would instantly change the Nautilus's heading. 
Standing by the port deadlight, I spotted magnificent coral substructures, zoophytes, algae, and crustaceans with enormous quivering claws that stretched forth from crevices in the rock. At 10.15, Captain Nemo himself took the helm. Dark and deep, a wide gallery opened ahead of us. The Nautilus was brazenly swallowed up. Strange rumblings were audible along our sides. It was the water of the Red Sea, hurled toward the Mediterranean by the tunnel's slope. Our engines tried to offer resistance by turning the waves with propeller in reverse, but the Nautilus went with the torrent as swift as an arrow. Along the narrow walls of this passageway, I saw only brilliant streaks, hard lines, fiery furrows, all scrawled by our speeding electric light. With my hand, I tried to curb the pounding of my heart. At 10.35, Captain Nemo left the steering wheel and turned to me. The Mediterranean, he told me. In less than 20 minutes, swept along by the torrent, the Nautilus had just cleared the Isthmus of Suez. End of Part 2, Chapter 5《Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne》Part 2, Chapter 6 — The Greek Islands At sunrise the next morning, February 12th, the Nautilus rose to the surface of the waves. I rushed onto the platform. The hazy silhouette of Pelusium was outlined three miles to the south. A torrent had carried us from one sea to the other, but although the tunnel was easy to descend, going back up must have been impossible. Near seven o'clock, Ned and Conciel joined me. Those two inseparable companions had slept serenely, utterly aware of the Nautilus's feet. "'Well, Mr. Naturalist,' the Canadian asked in a gently mocking tone, "'and how about that Mediterranean?' "'We're floating on its surface, Ned, my friend.' "'What?' Conciel put in. "'Last night?' "'Yes, last night, in a matter of minutes, we cleared that insuperable isthmus.' "'I don't believe a word of it,' the Canadian replied." And you're in the wrong, Mr. Land, I went on. That flat coastline curving southward is the coast of Egypt. Tell it to the Marines, sir, answered the stubborn Canadian. But if Master says so, Conseil told him, then so be it. What's more, Ned, I said, Captain Nemo himself did the honors in his tunnel, and I stood beside him in the pilot house while he steered the Nautilus through that narrow passageway. You hear, Ned? Conseil said. And you, Ned, who have such good eyes, I added, you can spot the jetties of Port Said stretching out to sea. The Canadian looked carefully. Correct, he said. You're right, Professor, and your captain's a superman. We're in the Mediterranean. Fine. So now let's have a chat about our little doings, if you please, but in such a way that nobody overhears. I could easily see what the Canadian was driving at. In any event, I thought it best to let him have his chat, and we all three went to sit next to the beacon, where we were less exposed to the damp spray from the billows. Now, Ned, we're all ears, I said. What have you to tell us? What I've got to tell you is very simple, the Canadian replied. We're in Europe, and before Captain Nemo's whims take us deep into the polar seas or back to Oceania, I say we should leave this Nautilus. I confess that such discussions with the Canadian always baffled me. I didn't want to restrict my companion's freedoms in any way, and yet I had no desire to leave Captain Nemo. Thanks to him and his submersible, I was finishing my undersea research by the day, and I was rewriting my book on the great ocean depths in the midst of its very element. Would I ever again have such an opportunity to observe the ocean's wonders? Absolutely not, so I couldn't entertain this idea of leaving the Nautilus before completing our course of inquiry. Ned, my friend, I said, answer me honestly. Are you bored with this ship? Are you sorry that fate has cast you into Captain Nemo's hands? The Canadian paused for a short while before replying, then crossing his arms, Honestly, he said, I'm not sorry about this voyage under the seas. I'll be glad to have done it, but in order to have done it, it has to finish. That's my feeling. It will finish, Ned. Where and when? Where I don't know, when I can't say, or rather, I suppose it will be over when these seas have nothing more to teach us. Everything that begins in this world must inevitably come to an end. I think as Master does, Conseil replied and it's extremely possible that after crossing every sea on the globe, Captain Nemo will bid the three of us a fond farewell. Bid us a fond farewell, the Canadian exclaimed. You mean beat us to a fare thee well. Let's not exaggerate, Mr. Land, I went on. We have nothing to fear from the captain, but neither do I share Conseil's views. We're privy to the Nautilus's secrets, and I don't expect that its commander, just to set us free, will meekly stand by while we spread those secrets all over the world. But in that case, what do you expect? the Canadian asked. 
that will encounter advantageous conditions for escaping just as readily in six months as now. Great Scott, Ned Land put in. And where, if you please, will we be in six months, Mr. Naturalist? Perhaps here, perhaps in China. You know how quickly the Nautilus moves. It crosses oceans like swallows cross the air, or express trains continents. It doesn't fear heavily traveled seas. Who can say it won't hug the coasts of France, England, or America, where an escape attempt could be carried out just as effectively as here? Professor Aronnax, the Canadian replied, Your arguments are rotten to the core. You talk way off in the future. We'll be here, we'll be there. Me, I'm talking about right now. We are here, and we must take advantage of it. I was hard-pressed by Ned Land's common sense, and I felt myself losing ground. I no longer knew what arguments to put forward on my behalf. Sir, Ned went on, let's suppose that by some impossibility Captain Nemo offered your freedom to you this very day. Would you accept? I don't know, I replied. And suppose he adds that this offer he's making you today won't ever be repeated. Then would you accept? I did not reply. And what thinks our friend Conciel? Ned Land asked. Your friend Conciel, the fine lad replied serenely, has nothing to say for himself. He is a completely disinterested party on this question. Like his master, like his comrade Ned, he's a bachelor. Neither wife, parents, nor children are waiting for him back home. He's in master's employ, he thinks like master, he speaks like master, and much to his regret, he can't be counted on to form a majority. Only two persons face each other here, master on one side, Ned Land on the other. That said, your friend Conciel is listening, and he's ready to keep score. I couldn't help smiling as Conciel wiped himself out of existence. Deep down, the Canadian must have been overjoyed at not having to contend with him. Then, sir, Ned Land said, since Conciel is no more, we'll have this discussion between just the two of us. I've talked, and you've listened. What's your reply? It was obvious that the matter had to be settled, and evasions were distasteful to me. Ned, my friend, I said, here's my reply. You have right on your side, and my arguments can't stand up to yours. It will never do to count on Captain Nemo's benevolence. The most ordinary good sense would forbid him to set us free. On the other hand, good sense decrees that we take advantage of our first opportunity to leave the Nautilus. Fine, Professor Aronnax, that's wisely said. But one proviso, I said, just one. The opportunity must be the real thing. Our first attempt to escape must succeed, because if it misfires, we won't get a second chance, and Captain Nemo will never forgive us. That's also well put, the Canadian replied. But your proviso applies to any escape attempt, whether it happens in two years or two days. So this is still the question. If a promising opportunity comes up, we have to grab it. Agreed. And now, Ned, will you tell me what you mean by a promising opportunity? One that leads the Nautilus on a cloudy night within a short distance of some European coast. And you'll try to get away by swimming? Yes, if we're close enough to the shore and the ships afloat on the surface. No, if we're well out and the ship's navigating under the waters. And in that event? In that event, I'll try to get hold of the skiff. I know how to handle it. We'll stick ourselves inside, undo the bolts, and rise to the surface without the helmsman in the bow seeing a thing. Fine, Ned. Stay on the lookout for such an opportunity. But don't forget, one slip-up will finish us. I won't forget, sir. And now, Ned, would you like to know my overall thinking on your plan? Gladly, Professor Aronnax. Well, then... I think, and I don't mean I hope, that your promising opportunity won't ever arise. Why not? Because Captain Nemo recognizes that we haven't given up all hope of recovering our freedom, and he'll keep on his guard, above all, in seas within sight of the coasts of Europe. I'm of Master's opinion, Conseil said. We'll soon see, Ned Land replied, shaking his head with a determined expression. And now, Ned Land, I asked, let's leave it at that, not another word on any of this. The day you're ready, alert us, and we're with you. I turn it all over to you. That's how we ended this conversation, which later was to have such serious consequences. At first, I must say, events seemed to confirm my forecasts, much to the Canadians' despair. Did Captain Nemo view us with distrust in these heavily traveled seas, or did he simply want to hide from the sight of those ships of every nation that plowed the Mediterranean? I have no idea, but usually he stayed in mid-water and well out from any coast. Either the Nautilus surfaced only enough to let its pilot house emerge, or it slipped away to the lower depths, although, between the Greek islands and Asia Minor, we didn't find bottom even at 2,000 meters down. Accordingly, I became aware of the Isle of Carpathos, one of the Sporides islands, only when Captain Nemo placed his finger over a spot on the world map and quoted me this verse from Virgil. Est in Carpathio Neptuni Gargite 
Vates, Carilius, Proteus. Latin. There in King Neptune's domain by Carpathos, his spokesman is Azur Hued Proteus. Editor. It was indeed that bygone abode of Proteus, the old shepherd of King Neptune's flocks, an island located between Rhodes and Crete, which Greeks now call Carpathos, Italians Scarpanto. Through the lounge window I could see only its granite bedrock. The next day, February 14th, I decided to spend a few hours studying the fish of this island group, but for whatever reason the panels remained hermetically sealed. After determining the Nautilus's heading, I noted that it was proceeding toward the ancient island of Crete, also called Candia. At the time I had shipped aboard the Abraham Lincoln, this whole island was in rebellion against its tyrannical rulers, the Ottoman Empire of Turkey. But since then I had absolutely no idea what happened to this revolution, and Captain Nemo, deprived of all contact with the shore, was hardly the man to keep me informed. So I didn't allude to this event when, that evening, I chanced to be alone with the captain in the lounge. Besides, he seemed silent and preoccupied. Then, contrary to custom, he ordered that both panels in the lounge be opened, and going from one to the other, he carefully observed the watery mass. For what purpose? I hadn't a guess, and for my part, I spent my time studying the fish that passed before my eyes. Among others, I noticed that sand goby mentioned by Aristotle and commonly known by the name of sea loach, which is encountered exclusively in the salty waters next to the Nile Delta. Near them, some semi-phosphorescent red porgy rolled by, a variety of gilt head that the Egyptians ranked among their sacred animals, lauding them in religious ceremonies when their arrival in the river's waters announced the fertile flood season. I also noticed some wrasse known as the tapiro, three decimeters long, bony fish with transparent scales whose bluish-gray color is mixed with red spots. They're enthusiastic eaters of marine vegetables, which gives them an exquisite flavor. Hence, these tapiro were much in demand by the epicures of ancient Rome, and their entrails were dressed with brains of peacock, tongue of flamingo, and testes of moray to make that divine platter that so enraptured the Roman emperor Vitilius. Another resident of these seas caught my attention and revived my memories of antiquity. This was the remora, which travels attached to the bellies of sharks. As the ancients tell it, when these little fish cling to the undersides of a ship, they can bring it to a halt, and by so impeding Mark Antony's vessel during the Battle of Actium, one of them facilitated the victory of Augustus Caesar. From such slender threads hang the destinies of nations. I also observed some wonderful snappers belonging to the order Lucianida, sacred fish for the Greeks, who claimed they could drive off sea monsters from the waters they frequent. Their Greek name, Antheus, means flower and they live up to it in the play of their colors and in those fleeting reflections that turn their dorsal fins into watered silk. Their hues are confined to a gamut of reds, from the pallor of pink to the glow of ruby. I couldn't take my eyes off these marine wonders when I was suddenly jolted by an unexpected apparition. In the midst of the waters, a man appeared, a diver carrying a leather bag at his belt. It was no corpse lost in the waves, it was a living man, swimming vigorously, sometimes disappearing to breathe at the surface, then instantly diving again. I turned to Captain Nemo, and in an agitated voice, "'A man! A castaway!' I exclaimed. "'We must rescue him at all cost!' The captain didn't reply, but went to lean against the window. The man drew near, and gluing his face to the panel, he stared at us. To my deep astonishment, Captain Nemo gave him a signal. The diver answered with his hand, immediately swam up to the surface of the sea, and didn't reappear. "'Don't be alarmed,' the captain told me. "'That's Nicholas from Cape Matapan, nicknamed Il Pesce. Italian, the fish, editor. He is well known throughout the Cyclades Islands, a bold diver. Water is his true element, and he lives in the sea more than on the shore, going constantly from one island to another, even to Crete. You know him, Captain? Why not, Professor Aronnax? This said, Captain Nemo went to a cabinet standing near the lounge's left panel. Next to this cabinet I saw a chest bound with hoops of iron, its lid bearing a copper plaque that displayed the Nautilus's monogram with its motto, Mobilis in Mobili. Just then, ignoring my presence, the captain opened this cabinet, a sort of safe that contained a large number of ingots. They were gold ingots, and they represented an enormous sum of money. Where had this precious metal come from? How had the captain amassed this gold, and what was he about to do with it? I didn't pronounce a word. I gaped. Captain Nemo took out the ingots one by one, and arranged them methodically inside the chest, filling it to the top, at which point I estimate that it held more than 1,000 kilograms of gold, in other words, close to 5 million francs. After securely fastening the chest, Captain Nemo wrote an address on its lid in characters that must have been modern Greek. 
This done, the captain pressed a button whose wiring was in communication with the crew's quarters. Four men appeared, and not without difficulty, pushed the chest out of the lounge. Then I heard them hoist it up the iron companionway by means of pulleys. Just then, Captain Nemo turned to me. You were saying, Professor? he asked me. I wasn't saying a thing, Captain. Then, sir, with your permission, I'll bid you good evening. And with that, Captain Nemo left the lounge. I re-entered my stateroom, very puzzled, as you can imagine. I tried in vain to fall asleep. I kept searching for a relationship between the appearance of the diver and that chest filled with gold. Soon, from certain rolling and pitching movements, I sensed that the Nautilus had left the lower strata and was back on the surface of the water. Then I heard the sound of footsteps on the platform. I realized that the skiff was being detached and launched to sea. For an instant it bumped the Nautilus's side, then all sounds ceased. Two hours later, the same noises, the same comings and goings, were repeated. Hoisted on board, the longboat was readjusted into its socket, and the Nautilus plunged back beneath the waves. So those millions had been delivered to their address. At what spot on the continent? Who was the recipient of Captain Nemo's gold? The next day, I related the night's events to Conseil and the Canadian, events that had aroused my curiosity to a fever pitch. My companions were as startled as I was. But where does he get those millions? Ned Land asked. To this, no reply was possible. After breakfast, I made my way to the lounge and went back to my work. I wrote up my notes until five o'clock in the afternoon. Just then, was it due to some personal indisposition, I felt extremely hot and had to take off my jacket made of fan muscle fabric. A perplexing circumstance because we weren't in the low latitudes, and besides, once the Nautilus was submerged, it shouldn't be subject to any rise in temperature. I looked at the pressure gauge. It marked a depth of 60 feet, a depth beyond the reach of atmospheric heat. I kept on working, but the temperature rose to the point of becoming unbearable. Could there be a fire on board, I wondered? I was about to leave the lounge when Captain Nemo entered. He approached the thermometer, consulted it, and turned to me. 42 degrees centigrade, he said. I've detected as much, Captain, I replied, and if it gets even slightly hotter, we won't be able to stand it. Oh, Professor, it won't get any hotter unless we want it to. You mean you can control this heat? No, but I can back away from the fireplace producing it. So it's outside? Surely. We're cruising in a current of boiling water. It can't be, I exclaimed. Look. The panels had opened, and I could see a completely white sea around the Nautilus. Steaming sulfurous fumes uncoiled in the midst of waves, bubbling like water in a boiler. I leaned my hand against one of the windows, but the heat was so great I had to snatch it back. Where are we? I asked. Near the island of Santorini, Professor, the captain answered me and right in the channel that separates the volcanic islets of Nia Kamini and Palea Kamini. I wanted to offer you the unusual sight of an underwater eruption. I thought, I said, that the formation of such new islands had come to an end. Nothing ever comes to an end in these volcanic waterways, Captain Nemo replied, and thanks to its underground fires, our globe is continuously under construction in these regions. According to the Latin historians Cassiodorus and Pliny, by the year 19 of the Christian era, a new island, the divine Thera had already appeared in the very place these islets have more recently formed. Then, Thera sank under the waves, only to rise and sink once more in the year 69 AD. From that day to this, such plutonic construction work has been in abeyance. But on February 3, 1866, a new islet named George Island emerged in the midst of the sulfurous steam near Nia Kamini and was fused to it by the 6th of the same month. Seven days later, on February 13th, the islet of Aferesa appeared, leaving a ten-meter channel between itself and Nia Kamini. I was in these seas when that phenomenon occurred, and I was able to observe its every phase. The islet of Aferesa was circular in shape, measuring 300 feet in diameter and 30 feet in height. It was made of black, glassy lava mixed with bits of feldspar. Finally, on March 10th, a smaller islet called Reka appeared next to Nia Kamini. And since then, these three islets have fused to form one single self-same island. What about this channel we're in now, I asked. Here it is, Captain Nemo replied, showing me a chart of the Greek islands. You observe that I've entered the new islets in their place. But will this channel fill up one day? Very likely, Professor Aronnax, because since 1866, eight little lava islets have surged up in front of the port of St. Nicholas on Pelea Kamini. So it's obvious that Nia and Pelea will join in days to come. In the middle of the Pacific, tiny infusoria build continents, but here they're built by volcanic phenomena. 
Look, sir, look at the construction work going on under these waves. I returned to the window. The Nautilus was no longer moving. The heat had become unbearable. From the white it had recently been, the sea was turning red, a coloration caused by the presence of iron salts. Although the lounge was hermetically sealed, it was filling with an intolerable stink of sulfur, and I could see scarlet flames of such brightness they overpowered our electric light. I was swimming in perspiration. I was stifling. I was about to be cooked. Yes, I felt myself cooking in actual fact. We can't stay any longer in this boiling water, I told the captain. No, it wouldn't be advisable, replied Captain Nemo the emotionless. He gave an order. The Nautilus tacked about and retreated from this furnace it couldn't brave with impunity. A quarter of an hour later, we were breathing fresh air on the surface of the waves. It then occurred to me that if Ned Land had chosen these waterways for our escape attempt, we wouldn't have come out alive from this sea of fire. The next day, February 16th, we left this basin, which tallies depths of 3,000 meters between Rhodes and Alexandria, and passing well out from Cerigo Island after doubling Cape Matapan, the Nautilus left the Greek islands behind. End of Part 2, Chapter 6《20,000 Leagues Under the Sea》by Jules Verne, translated by F. P. Walter. Chapter 31. The Mediterranean in 48 Hours. The Mediterranean, your ideal blue sea. To the Greeks, simply the sea. To Hebrews, the great sea. To Romans, Mare Nostrum. Bordered by orange trees, aloes, cactus, and maritime pine trees, Perfumed with the scent of myrtle, framed by rugged mountains, saturated with clean, transparent air, but continuously under construction by fires in the earth. This sea is a genuine battlefield, where Neptune and Pluto still struggle for world domination. Here on these beaches and waters, says the French historian Michelet, a man is revived by one of the most invigorating climates in the world. But as beautiful as it was, I could only get a quick look at this basin, whose surface area comprises two million square kilometers. Even Captain Nemo's personal insights were denied me, because that mystifying individual didn't appear one single time during our high-speed crossing. I estimate that the Nautilus covered a track of some 600 leagues under the waves of the sea, and this voyage was accomplished in just 24 hours times two. Departing from the waterways of Greece on the morning of February 16th, we cleared the Strait of Gibraltar by sunrise on the 18th. It was obvious to me that this Mediterranean, pinned in the middle of those shores he wanted to avoid, gave Captain Nemo no pleasure. Its waves and breezes brought back too many memories, if not too many regrets. Here he no longer had the ease of movement and freedom of maneuver that the oceans allowed him and his Nautilus felt cramped so close to the coast of both Africa and Europe. Accordingly, our speed was 25 miles, that is, 12 four-kilometer leagues per hour. Needless to say, Ned Land had to give up his escape plans, much to his distress. Swept along at the rate of 12 to 13 meters per second, he could hardly make use of the skiff. Leaving the Nautilus under these conditions would have been like jumping off a train racing at this speed. A rash move if there ever was one. Moreover, to renew our air supply, the submersible rose to the surface of the waves only at night, and relying solely on compass and log, it steered by dead reckoning. Inside the Mediterranean, then, I could catch no more of its fast-passing scenery than a traveler might see from an express train. In other words, I could view only the distant horizons, because the foregrounds flashed by like lightning. But Conseil and I were able to observe these Mediterranean fish, whose powerful fins kept pace for a while in the Nautilus's waters. We stayed on watch before the lounge windows, and our notes enabled me to reconstruct, in a few words, the ichthyology of this sea. Among the various fish inhabiting it, some I viewed, others I glimpsed, and the rest I missed completely because of the Nautilus's speed. Kindly allow me to sort them out using this whimsical system of classification. It will at least convey the quickness of my observations. In the midst of the watery mass, brightly lit by electric beams, there snaked past those one-meter lampreys that are common to nearly every clime. 
a type of ray from the genesis Oxyrhynchus, five feet wide, had a white belly with a spotted ash-gray back, and was carried along by the currents like a huge, wide-open shawl. Other rays passed by so quickly I couldn't tell if they deserved that name Eagle Ray, coined by the ancient Greeks, or those designations of Rat Ray, Bat Ray, and Toad Ray that modern fishermen have inflicted on them. Dogfish known as topes, twelve feet long and especially feared by divers, were racing with each other. Looking like big bluish shadows, thresher sharks went by, eight feet long and gifted with an extremely acute sense of smell. Dorados from the genus Sparus, some measuring up to thirteen decameters, appeared in silver and azure costumes encircled with ribbons, which contrasted with the dark color of their fins. Fish sacred to the goddess Venus, their eyes set in brows of gold, a valuable species that patronizes all waters fresh or salt, equally at home in rivers, lakes, and oceans, living in every clime, tolerating any temperature, their line dating back to prehistoric times on this earth, yet preserving all its beauty from those far-off days. Magnificent sturgeons, nine to ten meters long and extremely fast, bang their powerful tails against the glass of our panels, showing bluish blacks with small brown spots. They resemble sharks without equaling their strength, and are encountered in every sea. In the spring they delight in swimming up the great rivers, fighting the currents of the Volga, Danube, Po, Rhine, Lohr, and Oder, while feeding on herring, mackerel, salmon, and codfish. Although they belong to the class of cartilaginous fish, they rate as a delicacy. They are eaten fresh, dried, marinated, or salt-preserved, and in olden times they were borne in triumph to the table of the Roman epicure Lucilius. But whatever the Nautilus drew near the surface, these denizens of the Mediterranean I could observe most productively belonged to the 63rd genus of bony fish. These were tuna from the genus Scomber, blue-black on top, silver on the belly armor, their dorsal stripes giving off a golden gleam. They are said to follow ships in search of refreshing shade from the hot tropical sun, and they did just that with the Nautilus, as they had once done with the vessels of the Count de la Perros. For long hours they competed in speed with our submersible. I couldn't stop marveling at these animals so perfectly cut out for racing, their heads small, their bodies sleek, spindle-shaped, and in some cases over three meters long, their pectoral fins gifted with remarkable strength, their casual fins forked. Like certain flocks of birds, whose speed they equal, these tuna swim in triangular formation, which prompted the ancients to say they boned up on geometry and military strategy, and yet they can't escape the provincial fishermen, who prizes them as highly as did the ancient inhabitants of Turkey and Italy and these valuable animals, as oblivious as if they were deaf and blind, leap right into the Marseille tuna nets and perish by the thousands. Just for the record, I'll mention those Mediterranean fish that Conseil and I barely glimpsed. They were whitish eels of the species Gemonitus fasciusus that pass like elusive wisps of steam, conjure eels three to four meters long that were tricked out in green, blue, and yellow, three-foot hockey with a liver that makes a dainty morsel, wormfish drifting like thin seawood, sea robins that poets call leer fish, and trimmed with filaments, some shad spotted with black, gray, brown, blue, yellow, and green, that actually respond to tinkling handbells, splendid diamond-shaped turbo that were like aquatic pheasants with yellowish fins, stippled in brown and the left top side mostly marbled in brown and yellow, finely schools of wonderful red mullet, real oceanic birds of paradise that ancient Romans bought for as much as ten thousand siestres apiece, and which they killed at the table so they could heartlessly watch it change color from cinnabar red when alive to pallid white when dead. And as for other fish common to the Atlantic and Mediterranean, I was unable to observe miralets, triggerfish, puffers, seahorses, jewelfish, trumpetfish, blinis, gray mullet, wrasse, smelt, flying fish, anchovies, sea bream, porgies, garfish, or any of the cheap representatives of the order Pleuronecta, such as sole, flounder, place, dab, and brill, 
simply because of the dizzying speed with which the Nautilus hustled through these opulent waters. As for marine mammals, on passing by the mouth of the Adriatic Sea, I thought I recognized two or three sperm whales, equipped with a single dorsal fin, denoting the genesis Physeter, some pilot whales from the genesis Globicephalus, exclusive to the Mediterranean, the fore part of the head striped with small distinct lines, and also a dozen seals with white bellies and black coats, known by the name monk seals, and just as solemn as if they were three-meter Dominicans. For his part, Conseil thought he spotted a turtle six feet wide, and adorned with three protruding ridges that ran lengthwise. I was sorry to miss this reptile, because from Conseil's description, I believe I recognized the leatherback turtle, a pretty rare species. For my part, I noted only some loggerhead turtles with long carpuses. As for zoophytes, for a few moments I was able to marvel at a wonderful orange-hued hydra from the genesis Galeolaria that clung to the glass of our port panel. It consisted of a long, lean filament that spread out into countless branches and ended in the most delicate lace ever spun by the followers of our cane. Unfortunately, I couldn't fish up this wonderful specimen, and surely no other Mediterranean zoophytes would have been offered to my gaze, if on the evening of the 16th the Nautilus hadn't slowed down in an odd fashion. This was the situation. By then we were passing between Sicily and the coast of Tunisia. In the cramped space between Cape Bon and the Strait of Messiana, the sea bottom rises almost all at once. It forms an actual ridge with only 17 meters of water remaining above it, while the depth on either side is 170 meters. Consequently, the Nautilus had to maneuver with caution so as not to bump into this underwater barrier. I showed Conseil the position of this long reef on our chart of the Mediterranean. But with all due respect to Master, Conseil ventured to observe, it's like an actual isthmus connecting Europe to Africa. Yes, my boy, I replied, it cuts across the whole Strait of Sicily, and Smith's soundings prove that in the past these two continents were genuinely connected between Cape Bowie and Cape Farina. I can easily believe it, Conseil said. I might add, I went on, that there's a similar barrier between Gibraltar and Ceuta and in prehistoric times it closed off the Mediterranean completely. Gracious, Conseil put in, suppose one day some volcanic upheaval raises these two barriers back above the waves. That's most unlikely, Conseil. If Master will allow me to finish, I mean that if this phenomenon occurs, it might prove distressing to Mr. de Lesseps, who has gone to such pains to cut through his itmus. Again, but I repeat, Conseil, such a phenomenon won't occur. The intensity of those underground forces continues to diminish. Volcanoes were quite numerous in the world's early days, but they're going extinct one by one. The heat inside the earth is growing weaker. The temperature in the globe's lower strata is cooling appreciably every century, and to our globe's detriment, because its heat is its life. But the sun... The sun isn't enough, Conseil. Can it restore heat to a corpse? Not that I've heard. Well, my friend, some day the earth will be just such a cold corpse. Like the moon which long ago lost its vital heat, our globe will become lifeless and unlivable. In how many centuries, Conseil asked? In hundreds of thousands of years, my boy. Then we have ample time to finish our voyage, Conseil replied, if Ned Land doesn't mess things up. Thus reassured, Conseil went back to studying the shallows that the Nautilus was skimming at moderate speed. On the rocky volcanic seafloor, there bloomed quite a collection of moving flora. Sponges, sea cucumbers, jellyfish called sea gooseberries that were adorned with reddish tendrils and gave off a subtle phosphorescence, members of the genus Biro, that are commonly known by the name melon jellyfish and are bathed in the shimmer of the whole solar spectrum, free-swimming crinoids one meter wide that redden the waters with their crimson hue, tree-like basket stars of the greatest beauty, sea fans from the genus Pavonacea with long stems, numerous edible sea urchins of various species, plus green sea anemones with a grayish trunk and a brown disc lost beneath the olive-colored tresses of their tentacles. 
Ponciel kept especially busy observing mollusks and articulates, and although his catalog is a little dry, I wouldn't want to wrong the gallant lad by leaving out his personal observations. From the branch Mollusca, he mentions numerous comb-shaped scallops, hoof-like spiny oysters piled on top of each other, triangular coquina, three-pronged glass snails with yellow fins and transparent shells, orange snails from the genus Pleurobronchius that look like eggs spotted or speckled with greenish dots, members of the genus Aplysia, also known by the name sea hares, other sea hares from the genus Dolabella, plump paper bubble shells, umbrella shells exclusive to the Mediterranean, abalone whose shell produces a mother of pearl much in demand, pilgrim scallops, saddle shells that diners in the French province at Languedoc are said to like better than oysters. Some of these cockle shells so dear to the citizens of Marseilles, fat white Venus shells that are among the clams so abundant off the coast of North America, and eaten in such quantities by New Yorkers, variously colored comb shells with gill covers, burrowing date mussels with a peppery flavor I relish, furled heart cockles, whose shells have rib-like ridges on their arching summits, triton shells pocked with scarlet bumps, carniera snails with backward curving tips that make them resemble flimsy gondolas, crown ferrola snails, atlanta snails, with spiral shells, gray, nudie branches from the genesis tethys that were spotted with white and covered by fringe mantles, nudie branches from the suborder Elodia that look like small slugs, sea butterflies crawling on their back, sea shells from the genus Auricula, including the oval-shaped Auricula mysotis, tan wintel trap snails, common periwinkles, violet snails, cineraria snails, rock borers, ear shells, capricorn snails, pandora shells, etc. As for the articulates, in his notes, Conseil has very appropriately divided them into six classes, three of which belong to the marine world. These classes are the Crustacea, Cirripedia, and Annelidia. Crustaceans are subdivided into nine orders, and the first of these consists of the decapods, in other words, animals whose head and thorax are usually fused, whose cheek and mouth mechanism is made up of several pairs of appendages, and whose thorax has four, five, or six pairs of walking legs. Conseil used the methods of our mentor professor, Milne Edwards, who puts the decapods in three divisions, Brachura, Macura, and Anumura. These names may look a tad fierce, but they're accurate and appropriate. Among the Brachura, Conseil mentioned some Amanthia crabs, whose fronts were armed with two big diverging tips, those innocuous scorpions that, Lord knows why, symbolize wisdom to the ancient Greeks. Spider crabs of the Massina and Spinamina varieties that had probably gone astray in these shallows because they usually live in the lower depths. Xanthid crabs, Pilumina crabs, rhomboid crabs, granular box crabs, easy on the digestion, as Conseil ventured to observe, toothless mast crabs, Ibelia crabs, Simipolia crabs, woolly-handed crabs, etc. Among the Macura, which are subdivided into five families, hard shells, burrowers, crayfish, prawns, and ghost crabs, Conseil mentions some common spiny lobsters, whose females supply a meat highly prized, slippery lobsters or common shrimp, waterside jebia shrimp, and all sorts of edible species, but he says nothing of the crayfish subdivision that includes the true lobster, because spiny lobsters are the only type in the Mediterranean. Finally, among the anomura, he saw common drachnia grabs dwelling inside whatever abandoned seashells they could take over. Homola crabs with spiny fronts, hermit crabs, hairy porcelain crabs, etc. There, Conseil's work came to a halt. He didn't have time to finish off the class Crustacea through an examination of its stomopoids, amphipoids, homopoids, isopoids, trilobites, branchiopods, 
ostracods, and entomostracians. And in order to complete his study of marine articulates, he needed to mention the class Cirripedia, which contains water fleas and carp lice, plus the class Annelidia, which he would have divided without fail into tubifex worms and drosobranchiarian worms. But having gone past the shallows of the Strait of Sicily, the Nautilus resumed its usual deep water speed. From then on, no more mollusks, no more zoophytes, no more articulates, just a few large fish swimming by like shadows. During the night of February 16th to 17th, we entered the second Mediterranean basin, whose maximum depth we found at 3,000 meters. The Nautilus, driven downward by its propeller and slanting fins, descended to the lowest strata of this sea. There, in place of natural wonders, the watery mass offered some thrilling and dreadful scenes to my eyes. In essence, we were then crossing that part of the whole Mediterranean so fertile in casualties. From the coast of Algiers to the beaches of Provence, how many ships have wrecked, how many vessels have vanished. Compared to the vast liquid plains of the Pacific, the Mediterranean is a mere lake, but it's an unpredictable lake with fickle waves. Today kindly and affectionate to those frail single masters, drifting between a double ultramarine of sky and water, tomorrow bad-tempered and turbulent, agitated by the winds, demolishing the strongest ships beneath sudden waves that smash down with a headlong wallop. So in our swift cruise through these deep strata, how many vessels I saw lying on the seafloor, some already caked with coral, others clad only in a layer of rust, plus anchors, cannons, shells, iron fittings, propeller blades, parts of engines, cracked cylinders, staved in boilers, then hulls floating in mid-water, here upright, there overturned. Some of these wrecked ships had perished in collisions, others from hitting granite reefs. I saw a few that had sunk straight down, their masting still upright, their rigging stiffened by the water. They looked like they were at anchor by some immense open offshore mooring where they were waiting for their departure time. When the Nautilus passed between them, covering them with sheets of electricity, they seemed ready to salute us with their colors and send us their serial numbers. But no, nothing but silence and death filled this field of catastrophes. I observed that these Mediterranean depths became more and more cluttered with such gruesome wreckage as the Nautilus drew nearer to the Strait of Gibraltar. By then the shores of Africa and Europe were converging, and in this narrow space collisions were commonplace. There I saw numerous iron undersides, the phantasmagoric ruins of steamers, some lying down, others rearing up like fearsome animals. One of these boats made a dreadful first impression. Sides torn open, funnel bent, paddle wheels stripped to the mountings, rudder separated from the stern post and still hanging from an iron chain, the board on its stern eaten away by marine salts. How many lives were dashed in this shipwreck? How many victims were swept under the waves? Had some sailor on board lived to tell the story of this dreadful disaster, or do the waves still keep this casualty a secret? It occurred to me, Lord knows why, that this boat buried under the sea might have been the Atlas, lost with all hands some twenty years ago, and never heard from again. Oh, what a gruesome tale these Mediterranean depths could tell, this huge boneyard where so much wealth has been lost, where so many victims have met their deaths. Meanwhile, briskly unconcerned, the Nautilus ran at full propeller through the midst of these ruins. On February 18th, near three o'clock in the morning, it hove before the entrance to the Strait of Gibraltar. There are two currents here, an upper current long known to exist that carries the ocean's water into the Mediterranean basin, then a lower countercurrent, the only present-day proof of its existence being logic. In essence, the Mediterranean receives a continual influx of water, not only from the Atlantic, but from rivers emptying into it. Since local evaporation isn't enough to restore the balance, the total amount of added water should make the sea levels higher every year. Yet this isn't the case, and we're naturally forced to believe in the existence of some lower current that carries the Mediterranean surplus through the Strait of Gibraltar and into the Atlantic Basin. And so it turned out. The Nautilus took full advantage of this countercurrent. 
It advanced swiftly through this narrow passageway. For an instant I could glimpse the wonderful ruins of the Temple of Hercules, buried under sea, as Pliny and Avinus have mentioned, together with the flat island they stand on, and a few minutes later we were floating on the waves of the Atlantic. End of chapter 31 Recording by Rick Cornwall Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne, translated by F. P. Walter. Chapter 32 The Bay of Vigo. The Atlantic, a vast expanse of water whose surface area is twenty five million square miles, with a length of nine thousand miles and an average width of twenty seven hundred. A major sea nearly unknown to the agents, except perhaps the Carthaginians, those Dutchmen of antiquity who went along the west coasts of Europe and Africa on their commercial junkets. An ocean whose parallel winding shores form an immense perimeter fed by the world's greatest rivers, the St. Lawrence, Mississippi, Amazon, Plata, Orianco, Niger, Senegal, Elbe, Loire, and Rhine, which bring it waters from the most civilized countries as well as the most undeveloped areas. A magnificent plain of waves, ploughed continuously by ships of every nation, shaded by every flag in the country, and ending in those two dreadful headlands, so feared by navigators, Cape Horn and the Cape of Tempest. The Nautilus broke these waters with the edge of its spur after doing nearly ten thousand leagues in three and a half months, a track longer than a great circle of the earth. Where were we heading now, and what did the future have in store for us? Emerging from the Strait of Gibraltar, the Nautilus took to the high seas, to return to the surface of the waves. So our daily strolls on the platform were restored to us. I climbed on to it instantly, Ned Land and Conciel along with me. Twelve miles away, Cape St. Vincent was hazily visible, the southwestern tip of the Hispanic Peninsula. The wind was blowing a pretty strong gust from the south. The sea was swelling and surging. Its waves made the Nautilus roll and jerk violently. It was nearly impossible to stand up on the platform, which was continuously buffeted by this enormously heavy sea. After inhaling a few breaths of air, we went below once more. I repaired to my stateroom. Conciel returned to his cabin, but the Canadian, looking rather worried, followed me. Our quick trip through the Mediterranean hadn't allowed him to put his plans into execution, and he could barely conceal his disappointment. After the door to my stateroom was closed, he sat and stared at me silently. Ned, my friend, I told him, I know how you feel, but you mustn't blame yourself. Given the way the Nautilus was navigating, it would have been sheer insanity to think of escaping. Ned Land didn't reply. His pursed lips and frowning brow indicated that he was in the grip of his monomania. Look here, I went on, as yet there's no cause for despair. We're going up the coast of Portugal. France and England aren't far off, and there we'll easily find refuge. Oh, I grant you, if the Nautilus had emerged from the Strait of Gibraltar and made for that cape in the south, if it were taking us toward those regions that have no continents, then I'd share your alarm. But we now know that Captain Nemo doesn't avoid the seas of civilization, and in a few days I think we can safely take action. Ned Land stared at me, still more intently, and finally unpursed his lips. We'll do it this evening, he said. I straightened suddenly. I admit that I was less than ready for this announcement. I wanted to reply to the Canadian, but words failed me. We agreed to wait for the right circumstances, Ned Land went on. Now we've got those circumstances. This evening we'll be just a few miles off the coast of Spain. It'll be a cloudy night. The wind's blowing toward shore. You gave me your promise, Professor Aronnax, and I'm counting on you. Since I didn't say anything, the Canadian stood up and approached me. We'll do it this evening at nine o'clock, he said. I've alerted Conciel, and by that time Captain Nemo will be locked in his room and probably in bed. Neither the mechanics or the crewmen will be able to see us. Conciel and I will go to the central companionway. As for you, Professor Aronnax, 
you'll stand in the library two steps away and wait for my signal. The oars, mast, and sail are in the skiff. I've even managed to stow some provisions inside. I've gotten a hold of a monkey wrench to unscrew the nuts bolting the skiff to the Nautilus's hull. So everything's ready. I'll see you this evening. The sea is rough, I said. Admitted, the Canadian replied, but we've got to risk it. Freedom is worth paying for. Besides, the longboat's solidly built, and a few miles with the wind behind us is no big deal. By tomorrow, who knows if this ship won't be a hundred leagues out to sea. If circumstances are in our favor, between ten and eleven this evening, we'll be landing on some piece of solid ground, or we'll be dead. So we're in God's hands, and I'll see you this evening. Thus said, the Canadian withdrew, leaving me close to dumbfounded. I had imagined that if it came to this, I would have time to think about it, to talk it over. My stubborn companion hadn't granted me this courtesy. But after all, what would I have said to him? Ned Land was right a hundred times over. These were near ideal circumstances, and he was taking full advantage of them. In my selfish personal interests, could I go back on my word and be responsible for ruining the future lives of my companions? Tomorrow, might not Captain Nemo take us far away from any shore? Just then a fairly loud hissing told me that the ballast tanks were filling, and the Nautilus sank beneath the waves of the Atlantic. I stayed in my stateroom. I wanted to avoid the captain, to hide from his eyes the agitation overwhelming me. What an agonizing day I spent, torn between my desire to regain my free will and my regret at abandoning this marvelous Nautilus, leaving my underwater research incomplete. How could I relinquish this ocean, my own Atlantic, as I like to call it, without observing its lower strata, without wresting from it kinds of secrets that had been revealed to me by the seas of the East Indies and the Pacific. I was putting down my novel half-read. I was waking up as my dream neared its climax. How painfully the hours passed! And as I sometime envisioned myself safe on shore with my companions, or despite my better judgment, as I sometimes wished that some unforeseen circumstances would prevent Ned Land from carrying out his plans. Twice I went to the lounge. I wanted to consult the compass. I wanted to see if the Nautilus's heading was actually taking us closer to the coast, or spiriting us farther away. But no, the Nautilus was still in Portuguese waters. Heading north, it was cruising along the ocean's beaches. So I had to resign myself to my fate and get ready to escape. My baggage wasn't heavy, my notes, nothing more. As for Captain Nemo, I wondered what he could make of our escaping, what concern or perhaps what distress it might cause him, and what he would do in the twofold event of our attempt, either failing or being found out. Certainly I had no complaints to register with him. On the contrary, never was hospitality more wholehearted than his. Yet in leaving him I couldn't be accused of ingratitude. No solemn promises bound us to him. In order to keep us captive, he had counted only on the force of circumstances, and not on our word of honor. But his avowed intention to imprison us forever on this ship justified our every effort. I hadn't seen the captain since our visit to the island of Santorini. Would fate bring me his presence before our departure? I both desired and dreaded it. I listened for footsteps in the stateroom adjoining mine. Not a sound reached my ear. His stateroom had to be deserted. Then I began to wonder if this eccentric individual was even on board. Since that night when the skiff had left the Nautilus on some mysterious mission, my ideas about him had subtly changed. In spite of everything, I thought that Captain Nemo must have kept up some type of relationship with the shore. Did he himself never leave the Nautilus? Whole weeks had often gone by without my encountering him. What was he doing all the while? During all those times, I thought he was convalescing in the grip of some misanthropic fit. Was he instead far away from the ship, involved in some secret activity whose nature still eluded me? All these ideas and a thousand others assaulted me at the same time. In these strange circumstances, the scope for conjecture was unlimited. I felt an unbearable queasiness. This day of waiting seemed endless. The hours struck too slowly to keep up with my impatience. 
As usual, dinner was served me in my stateroom. Full of anxiety, I ate little. I left the table at seven o'clock. One hundred and twenty minutes. I was keeping track of them. Still separated me from the moment I was to rejoin Ned Land. My agitation increased. My pulse was throbbing violently. I couldn't stand still. I walked up and down, hoping to calm my troubled mind with movement. The possibility of perishing in our reckless undertaking was the least of my worries. My heart was pounding at the thought that our plans might be discovered before we left the Nautilus, at the thought of being hauled in in front of Captain Nemo and finding him angered, or worse, saddened by my deserting him. I wanted to see the lounge one last time. I went down the gangways and arrived at the museum where I had spent so many pleasant and productive hours. I stared at all its wealth, all its treasures, like a man on the eve of his eternal exile, a man departing to return no more. For so many days now these natural wonders and artistic masterworks had been central to my life, and I was about to leave them behind forever. I wanted to plunge my eyes through the lounge window and into those Atlantic waters, but the panels were hermetically sealed, and a mantle of sheet iron separated me from this ocean with which I was still unfamiliar. Crossing through the lounge, I arrived at the door, contrived in one of the canted corners that opened into the captain's stateroom. Much to my astonishment, this door was ajar. I instinctively recoiled. If Captain Nemo was in his stateroom, he might see me. But not hearing any sounds, I approached. The stateroom was deserted. I pushed the door open. I took a few steps inside. Still the same austere, monastic appearance. Just then my eye was caught by some etchings hanging on the wall, which I hadn't noticed during my first visit. They were portraits of great men of history who had spent their lives in perpetual devotion to a great human ideal. Thaddeus Kosciusko, the hero whose dying words had been Fini Polianai. Marcos Bozzarius, for modern Greece the reincarnation of Sparta's King Leonidas, Daniel O'Connell, Ireland's defender. George Washington, founder of the American Union. Danielle Manon, the Italian patriot. Abraham Lincoln, dead from the bullet of a believer in slavery. And finally that martyr for the redemption of the black race, John Brown, hanging from his gallows as Victor Hugo's pencil has so terrifyingly depicted. What was the bond between these heroic souls and the soul of Captain Nemo? From this collection of portraits could I finally unravel the mystery of his existence? Was he a fighter for oppressed people, a liberator of enslaved races? Had he figured in the recent political or social upheavals of this century? Was he a hero of that dreaded civil war at America, a war lamentable yet forever glorious? Suddenly the clock struck eight. The first stroke of its hammer on the chime snapped me out of my musings. I shuddered as if some invisible eye had plunged into my innermost thoughts, and I rushed outside the stateroom. There my eyes fell on the compass. Our heading was still northerly. The log indicated a moderate speed, the pressure gauge a depth of about sixty feet, so circumstances were in favor of the Canadian's plans. I stayed in my stateroom. I dressed warmly. Fishing boots, otter cap, coat of fan musil fabric lined with sealskin. I was ready, I was waiting. Only the propeller's vibrations disturbed the deep silence reigning on board. I cocked an ear and listened. Would a sudden outburst of voices tell me that Ned Land's escape plans had been detected? A ghastly uneasiness stole through me. I tried in vain to recover my composure. A few minutes before nine o'clock, I glued my ear to the captain's door. Not a sound. I left my stateroom and returned to the lounge, which was deserted and plunged in near darkness. I opened the door leading to the library. The same inadequate light, the same solitude. I went to man my post near the door opening into the well of the central companionway, and I waited for Ned Land's signal. At this point the propeller's vibrations slowed down appreciably. Then they died out altogether. Why was the Nautilus stopping? Whether this layover would help or hinder Ned Land's schemes, I couldn't have said. 
The silence was further disturbed only by the pounding of my heart. Suddenly I felt a mild jolt. I realized that Nautilus had come to rest on the ocean floor, and my alarm increased. The Canadian signal hadn't reached me. I longed to rejoin Ned Land and urge him to postpone his attempt. I sensed that we were no longer navigating under normal conditions. Just then the door to the main lounge opened, and Captain Nemo appeared. He saw me, and without further preamble, "'Ah, Professor,' he said in an affable tone, "'I've been looking for you. Do you know your Spanish history?' Even if he knew it by heart, a man in my disturbed, befuddled condition couldn't have quoted a syllable of his own country's history. "'Well,' Captain Nemo went on, "'did you hear my question? Do you know the history of Spain?' "'Very little of it,' I replied. The most learned men, the captain said, still have much to learn. Have a seat, he added, and I'll tell you an unusual episode in this body of history. The captain stretched out on a couch, and I mechanically took a seat near him, but half in the shadows. Professor, he said, listen carefully. This piece of history concerns you in one definite respect, because it will answer a question you've no doubt been unable to resolve. I'm listening, captain, I said not knowing what my partner in this dialogue was driving at, and wondering if this incident related to our escape plans. Professor, Captain Nemo went on, if you're amenable, we'll go back in time to 1702. You're aware of the fact that in those days your King Louis the Fourteenth thought an imperial gesture would suffice to humble the Pyrenees in the dust. So he inflicted his grandson, the Duke of Anjou, on the Spaniards reigning more or less poorly under the name King Philip V, this aristocrat had to deal with mighty opponents abroad. In essence, the year before, the royal houses of Holland, Austria, and England had signed a treaty of alliance at The Hague, aiming to wrest the Spanish crown from King Philip V and to place it on the head of an archduke whom they prematurely dubbed King Charles III. Spain had to withstand these allies, but the country had practically no army or navy. Yet it wasn't short of money, provided that its galleons, laden with gold and silver from America, could enter its ports. Now then, late in 1702, Spain was expecting a rich convoy which France ventured to escort with a fleet of 23 vessels under the command of Admiral de Chateau Renault, because by that time the Allied navies were roving the Atlantic. This convoy was supposed to be put into Cadiz, but after learning that the English fleet lay across these waterways, the Admiral decided to make for a French port. The Spanish commanders in the convoy objected to this decision. They wanted to be taken to a Spanish port, if not to Cadiz, then to the Bay of Vigo, located on Spain's northwest coast, and not blockaded. Admiral de Chateau Renault was so indecisive as to obey this directive, and the galleons entered the Bay of Vigo. Unfortunately, this bay forms an open, offshore mooring that's impossible to defend, so it was essential to hurry and empty the galleons before the Allied fleets arrived, and there would have been ample time for this unloading if a wretched question of trade agreements hadn't suddenly come up. Are you clear on the chain of events? Captain Nemo asked me. Perfectly clear, I said, not yet knowing why I was being given this history lesson. Then I'll continue. Here's what came to pass. The tradesmen of Cadiz had negotiated a charter whereby they were to receive all merchandise coming from the West Indies. Now then, unloading the ingots from these galleons at the port of Vigo would have been a violation of their rights. So they lodged a complaint in Madrid, and they obtained an order from the indecisive King Philip V. Without unloading, the convoy would stay in custody at the offshore mooring of Vigo, until the enemy fleets had retreated. Now then, just as the decision was being handed down, English vessels arrived in the Bay of Vigo on October 22, 1702. Despite his inferior forces, Admiral de Chateau Renault fought courageously, but when he saw that the convoy's wealth was about to fall into enemy's hands, he burned and scuttled the scallions, which went to the bottom with their immense treasures. Captain Nemo stopped. I admit it, I still couldn't see how this piece of history concerned me. Well, I asked him. Well, Professor Aronnax, Captain Nemo answered me, 
we're actually in the Bay of Vigo, and all that's left is for you to probe the mysteries of the place. The captain stood up and invited me to follow him. I'd had time to collect myself. I did so. The lounge was dark, but the sea's waves sparkled through the transparent windows. I stared. Around the Nautilus, for a half a mile radius, the water seemed saturated with electric light. The sandy bottom was clear and bright. Dressed in diving suits, crewmen were busy clearing away half-rotted barrels and disemboweled trunks in the midst of the dinghy hulks of ships. Out of these trunks and kegs spilled ingots of gold and silver, cascades of jewels, pieces of eight. The sand was heaped with them. Then, laden with these valuable spoils, the men returned to the Nautilus, dropped off their burdens inside, and went to resume this inexhaustible fishing for silver and gold. I understood. This was the setting of that battle on October 22, 1702. Here, in this very place, those galleons carrying treasure to the Spanish government had gone down to the bottom. Here, whenever he needed, Captain Nemo came to withdraw these millions to ballast his Nautilus. It was for him, for him alone, that America had yielded up his precious metals. He was the direct, sole heir to these treasures, wrested from the Incas and those people conquered by Hernando Cortez. "'Did you know, Professor,' he asked with a smile, "'that the sea contains such wealth?' "'I know it's estimated,' I replied, "'that there are two million metric tons of silver "'held in suspension in seawater.' "'Surely, but in extracting that silver, "'your expenses would outweigh your profits. "'Here, by contrast, I have only to pick up "'what other men have lost, "'and not only in this Bay of Vigo, "'but at a thousand other sites where ships have gone down.' whose positions are marked on my underwater chart. Do you understand now that I'm rich to the tune of billions? I understand, Captain. Nevertheless, allow me to inform you that by harvesting this very Bay of Vigo, you're simply forestalling the efforts of a rival organization. What organization? A company chartered by the Spanish government to search for these sunken galleons. The company's investors were lured by the bait of enormous gains, because this scuttled treasure is estimated to be worth five hundred million francs. It was five hundred million francs, Captain Nemo replied, but no more. Right, I said. Hence a timely warning to these investors would be an act of charity. Yet who knows if it would be well received. Usually what gamblers regret the most isn't the loss of their money, so much as the loss of their insane hopes. But ultimately I feel less sorry for them than for the thousands of unfortunate people who would have benefited from a fair distribution of this wealth, whereas now it will be of no help to them. No sooner had I voiced this regret than I felt it must have wounded Captain Nemo. No help, he replied with growing animation. Sir, what makes you assume this wealth goes to waste when I'm the one amassing it? Do you think I toil to gather this treasure out of selfishness? Who says I don't put it to good use? Do you think I'm unaware of the suffering beings and oppressed races living on this earth? Poor people to comfort, victims to avenge? Don't you understand? Captain Nemo stopped on these last words, perhaps sorry that he had said too much. But I had guessed. Whatever motives had driven him to seek independence under the seas, he remained a human being before all else. His heart still throbbed for suffering humanity and his immense philanthropy went out both to downtrodden races and to individuals. And now I knew where Captain Nemo had delivered those millions, when the Nautilus navigated the waters where Crete was in rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. End of chapter 32 Recording by Rick Cornwall Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne Translated by F. P. Walter Chapter 33 A Lost Continent The next morning, February 19, I beheld the Canadian entering my stateroom. I was expecting this visit. He wore an expression of great disappointment. Well, sir, he said to me, Well, Ned, the fates were against us yesterday. Yes, that damned captain had to call a halt just as we were going to escape from his boat. 
Yes, Ned, he had business with his bankers. His bankers? Or rather, his bank vaults, by which I mean this ocean, where his wealth is safer than in any national treasure. Then I related the evening's incident to the Canadian, secretly hoping he would come around to the idea of not deserting the captain. But my narrative had no result other than Ned's voicing deep regret that he hadn't strolled across the Vigo battlefield on his own behalf. Anyhow, he said, it's not over yet. My first harpoon missed. That's all. We'll succeed the next time, and as soon as this evening, if need be. What's the Nautilus heading? I asked. I've no idea, Ned replied. All right, and noon we'll find out what our position is. The Canadian returned to Council's side. As soon as I was dressed, I went into the lounge. The compass wasn't encouraging. The Nautilus's course was south-southwest. We were turning our backs on Europe. I could hardly wait until our position was reported on the chart. Near 11.30, the ballast tanks emptied, and the submersible rose to the surface of the ocean. I leaped onto the platform. Ned Land was already there. No more shore in sight. Nothing but the immenseness of the sea. A few sails were on the horizon. No doubt ships going as far as Cape Sao Rock to find favorable winds for doubling the Cape of Good Hope. The sky was overcast. A squall was on the way. Furious, Ned tried to see through the mist on the horizon. He still hoped that behind all that fog there lay those shores he longed for. At noon the sun made a momentary appearance. Taking advantage of the rift in the clouds, the chief officer took the orb's altitude. Then the sea grew turbulent. We went below again, and the hatch closed once more. When I consulted the chart an hour later, I saw that the Nautilus's position was marked at longitude 16 degree 17 minutes and latitude 33 degree 22 minutes, a good 150 leagues from the nearest coast. It wouldn't do to even dream of escaping, and I'll let the reader decide how promptly the Canadian threw a tantrum when I ventured to tell him our situation. As for me, I wasn't exactly grief-stricken. I felt as if a heavy weight had been lifted from me, and I was able to resume my regular tasks in a state of comparative calm. Near eleven o'clock in the evening, I received a most unexpected visit from Captain Nemo. He asked me, very graciously, if I felt exhausted from our vigil the night before. I said no. Then, Professor Arona, I propose an unusual excursion. Propose away, Captain. So far we've visited the ocean depths only by day and under sunlight. Would you like to see these depths on a dark night? Very much. I warn you, this will be an exhausting stroll. We'll need to walk long hours and scale a mountain. The roads aren't terribly well kept up. Everything you say, Captain, just increases my curiosity. I'm ready to go with you. Then come along, Professor, and we'll go put on our diving suits. Arriving at the wardrobe, I saw that neither my companions nor any crewmen would be coming with us on this excursion. Captain Nemo hadn't even suggested my fetching Ned or Conseil. In a few moments, we had put on our equipment. Air tanks, abundantly charged, were placed on our backs, but the electric lamps were not in readiness. I commented on this to the captain. They'll be useless to us, he replied. I thought I hadn't heard him right, but I couldn't repeat my comment because the captain's head had already disappeared into its metal covering. I finished harnessing myself, 
I felt an alpenstock being placed in my hand, and a few minutes later, after the usual procedures, we set foot on the floor of the Atlantic, three hundred meters down. Midnight was approaching. The waters were profoundly dark, but Captain Nemo pointed to a reddish spot in the distance, a sort of white glow shimmering about two miles from the Nautilus. What this fire was, what substances fed it, how and why it kept burning in the liquid mass, I couldn't say. Anyhow, it lit our way, although hazily, but I soon grew accustomed to this unique gloom, and in these circumstances I understood the uselessness of the room curve device. Side by side, Captain Nemo and I walked directly toward this conspicuous flame. The level seafloor rose imperceptibly. We took long strides, helped by our open stocks, but in general our progress was slow, because our feet kept sinking into a kind of slimy mud mixed with seaweed and assorted flat stones. As we moved forward, I heard a kind of pitter-patter above my head. Sometimes this noise increased and became a continuous crackle. I soon realized the cause. It was a heavy rainfall rattling on the surface of the waves. Instinctively, I worried that I might get soaked by water in the midst of water. I couldn't help smiling at this outlandish notion. But to tell the truth, wearing those heavy diving suits, you no longer feel the liquid element. You simply think you are in the midst of air a little denser than air on land, that's all. After half an hour of walking, the seafloor grew rocky. Jellyfish, microscopic crustacean, and sea pen coral lit it faintly with their phosphorescent glimmers. I glimpsed piles of stones covered by a couple million zoophytes and tangles of algae. My feet often slipped on this vicious seaweed carpet, and without my open stock I would have fallen more than once. When I turned around, I could still see the Nautilus' whitish beacon, which was starting to grow pale in the distance. Those piles of stones just mentioned were laid out on the ocean floor with a distinct but inexplicable symmetry. I spotted gigantic furrows trailing off into the distant darkness, their length incalculable. There also were other peculiarities I couldn't make sense of. It seemed to me that my heavy laid soles were crushing a litter of bones that made a dry, crackling noise. So what were these vast plains we were now crossing? I wanted to ask the captain but I still didn't grasp that sign language that allowed him to chat with his companions when they went with him on his underwater excursions. Meanwhile, the reddish light guiding us had expanded and inflamed the horizon. The presence of this furnace under the waters had me extremely puzzled. Was it some sort of electrical discharge? Was I approaching some natural phenomenon still unknown to scientists on shore? Or rather, and this thought did cross my mind, had the hand of man intervened in that blaze? Had human beings fanned those flames? In these deep strata, would I meet up with more of Captain Nemo's companions, friends he was about to visit who led lives as strange as his own? Would I find a whole colony of exiles down here, men tired of the world's woes, men who had sought and found independence in the ocean's lower depths? All these insane, inadmissible ideas dogged me, and in this frame of mind, continually excited by the series of wonders passing before my eyes, I wouldn't have been surprised to find on this sea bottom one of those underwater towns Captain Nemo dreamed about. Our path was getting brighter and brighter. 
the red glow had turned white and was radiating from a mountain peak about 800 feet high. But what I saw was simply a reflection produced by the crystal waters of this strata. The furnace that was the source of this inexplicable light occupied the far side of the mountain. In the midst of these stone mazes following this Atlantic seafloor, Captain Nemo moved forward without hesitation. He knew this dark path. No doubt he had often traveled it and was incapable of losing his way. I followed him with unshakable confidence. He seemed like some spirit of the sea. And as he walked ahead of me, I marveled at his tall figure, which stood out in black against the glowing background of the horizon. It was one o'clock in the morning. We arrived at the mountain's lower gradients, but in grappling with them, we had to venture up difficult trails through a huge thicket. Yes, a thicket of dead trees. Trees without leaves, without sap, turned to stone by the action of the waters, and crowned here and there by gigantic pines. It was like a still erect coal field, its roots clutching broken soil, its boths clearly outlined against the ceiling of the waters like thin black paper cutouts. Picture a forest clinging to the sides of a peak in the Hartz Mountains, but a submerged forest. The trails were cluttered with algae and focus plants, Hosts of crustaceans swarming among them. I plunged on, scaling rocks, straddling fallen tree trunks, snapping marine creepers that swayed from one tree to another, startling the fish that flitted from branch to branch. Carried away, I didn't feel exhausted anymore. I followed a guide who was immune to exhaustion. What a sight! How can I describe it? How can I portray these woods and rocks in this liquid setting? Their lower parts dark and sullen, their upper parts tinted red in this light, whose intensity was doubled by the reflecting power of the waters. We scaled the rocks that crumbled behind us, collapsing in enormous sections with the hollow rumble of an avalanche. To our right and left, there were carved gloomy galleries, where the eye lost its way. Huge glades opened up, seemingly cleared by the hand of man, and I sometimes wondered whether some residents of these underwater regions would suddenly appear before me. But Captain Nemo kept climbing. I didn't want to fall behind. I followed him boldly. My alpenstock was a great help. One wrong step would have been disastrous on the narrow paths cut into the sides of these chasms. But I walked along with a firm tread and without the slightest feeling of dizziness. Sometimes I leaped over a crevice whose depth would have made me recoil had I been in the midst of glaciers on shore. Sometimes I ventured out on a wobbling tree trunk fallen across a gorge, without looking down, having eyes only for marveling at the wild scenery of this region. There, leaning on erratically cut foundations, monumental rocks seemed to defy the laws of balance. From between their stony knees, trees sprung up like jets under fearsome pressure, supporting other trees that supported them in turn. Next, natural towers with wide, steeply carved battlements leaned at angles that on dry land the laws of gravity would never have authorized. And I, too, could feel the difference created by the water's powerful density. Despite my heavy clothing, copper headpiece, and metal soles, I climbed the most impossible steep gradients with all the nimbleness, I swear it, of a chamois or a Pyrenees mountain goat. 
As for my account of this excursion under the waters, I'm well aware that it sounds incredible. I'm the chronicler of deeds seemingly impossible and yet incontestably real. This was no fantasy. This was what I saw and felt. Two hours after leaving the Nautilus, we had cleared the timberline, and a hundred feet above our heads stood the mountain peak, forming a dark silhouette against the brilliant glare that came from its far slope. Petrified shrubs rumbled here and there in sprawling zigzags. Fish rose in a body at our feet like birds startled in tall grass. The rocky mass was gouged with impenetrable crevices, deep caves, unfathomable holes at whose far ends I could hear fearsome things moving around. My blood was curled as I watched some enormous antenna bar my path, or saw some frightful pincer snap shut in the shadow of some cavity. A thousand specks of light glittered in the midst of the gloom. They were the eyes of gigantic crustaceans crouching in their lairs, giant lobsters rearing up like spear carriers and moving their claws with a scrap iron clanking. Titanic crabs aiming their bodies like cannons on their carriages, and hideous devil fish intertwining their tentacles like bushes of writhing snakes. What was this astounding world that I didn't yet know? In what order did these articulates belong? These creatures for which the rocks provided a second carapace? Where had nature learned the secret of their vegetating existence, and for how many centuries had they lived in this ocean's lower strata? But I couldn't linger. Captain Nemo, on familiar terms with these dreadful animals, no longer minded them. We arrived at a preliminary plateau, where still some surprises were waiting for me. There picturesque ruins took shape, betraying the hand of man, not our creator. They were huge stacks of stones in which you could distinguish the indistinct forms of palaces and temples, now arrayed in hosts of blossoming zoophytes, and over it all not ivy, but a heavy mantle algae and focus plants. But what part of the globe could this be? This land swallowed by cataclysms, who had set up these rocks and stones like the dolmens of prehistoric times? Where was I? Where had Captain Nemo's fancies taken me? I wanted to ask him. Unable to, I stopped him. I seized his arm. But he shook his head, pointed to a mountain's topmost peak, and seemed to tell me, Come on, come with me come higher. I followed him with one last burst of energy, and in a few minutes I had scaled the peak, which crowned the whole rocky mass by some ten meters. I looked back down the side we had just cleared. There the mountain rose only seven hundred to eight hundred feet above the plains, but on its far slope it crowned the receding bottom of this part of the Atlantic by a height twice that. My eyes scanned the distance and took in a vast area lit by intense flashes of light. In essence, this mountain was a volcano. Fifty feet below its peak, amid a shower of stones and slag, a wide crater vomited torrents of lava that were dispersed in fiery cascades into the heart of the liquid mass. So situated, this volcano was an immense torch that lit up the lower plains all the way to the horizon. As I said, this underwater crater spewed lava, but not flames. Flames need oxygen from the air and are unable to spread underwater, but a lava flow which contains in itself the principle of its incandescence, 
can rise to a white heat, overpower the liquid element, and turn it into steam on contact. Swift currents swept away all the diffuse gas, and torrents of lava slid to the foot of the mountain, like the disgorging of Mount Vesuvius over the city limits of a second Torre del Greco. In fact, this beneath my eyes was a town in ruins, demolished, overwhelmed, laid low, its roofs carved in, its temples pulled down, its arches dislocated, its columns stretching over the earth. In these ruins you could still detect the solid proportions of a sort of Tuscan architecture. Farther off, the remains of a gigantic aqueduct. Here, the caked heights of an acropolis, along with the fluid forms of a Parthenon. There, the remnants of a wharf, as if some bygone port had long ago harbored merchant vessels and triple-tiered war galleys on the shores of some lost ocean. Still farther off, long rows of collapsing walls, deserted thoroughfares, a whole Pompeii buried under the waters, which Captain Nemo has resurrected before my eyes. Where was I? Where was I? I had to find out at all cost. I wanted to speak. I wanted to rip off the copper sphere imprisoned in my head. But Captain Nemo came over and stopped me with a gesture. Then, picking up a piece of chalky stone, he advanced to a black basaltic rock and scrawled this one word, Atlantis. What lightning flashed through my mind? Atlantis, that ancient land of Meropis mentioned by the historian Theopompus, Plato's Atlantis, the continent whose very existence had been denied by such philosophers and scientists as Origen, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Donville, Maltebrun, and Humboldt, who entered its disappearance in the ledger of myths and folk tales, the country whose reality had nevertheless been accepted by such other thinkers as Posidonius, Pliny, Ammianus Marcellinus, Tertullian, Engel, Scherer, Tournefort, Buffon, and Davezac. I had this land right under my eyes, furnishing its own unimpeachable evidence of the catastrophe that had overtaken it. So this was a submerged region that had existed outside Europe, Asia, and Libya, beyond the pillars of Hercules, home of those powerful Atlantean people against whom ancient Greece had waged its earliest wars. The writer whose narratives record the lofty deeds of those heroic times is Plato himself. His dialogues, Timaeus and Critias, were drafted with the poet and legislator Solon, as their inspiration, as it were. One day Solon was conversing with some elderly wise men in the Egyptian capital of Sais, a town already eight thousand years of age, as documented by the annals engraved on the sacred walls of its temples. One of these elders related the history of another town a thousand years older still, this original city of Athens, ninety centuries old, had been invaded and partly destroyed by the Atlanteans. These Atlanteans, he said, resided on an immense continent greater than Africa and Asia combined, taking in an area that lay between latitude twelve degree and forty degree north. Their dominion extended even to Egypt, they tried to enforce their rule as far as Greece, but they had to retreat before the indomitable resistance of the Hellenic people. Centuries passed. A cataclysm occurred. Floods, earthquakes, 
A single night and day were enough to obliterate this Atlantis, whose highest peak, Madeira, the Azores, the Canaries, the Cape Verde Islands, still emerge above the waves. These were the historical memories that Captain Nemo's scroll sent rushing through my mind. Thus, led by the strangest of fates, I was treading underfoot one of the mountains of that continent. My hands were touching ruins many thousands of years old, contemporary with prehistoric times. I was walking in the very place where contemporaries of early men had walked. My heavy souls were crushing the skeletons of animals from the age of fable, animals that used to take cover in the shade of these trees now turned to stone. Oh, why was I so short of time? I would have gone down the steep slopes of this mountain, crossed this entire immense continent, which surely connects Africa with America, and visited its great prehistoric cities. Under my eyes there perhaps lay the warlike town of Machimos, or the pious village of Eusebius, whose gigantic inhabitants lived for whole centuries and had the strength to raise blocks of stone that still withstood the action of the waters. One day, perhaps, some volcanic phenomenon will bring these sunken ruins back to the surface of the waves. Numerous underwater volcanoes have been sighted in this part of the ocean, and many ships have felt terrific tremors when passing over these turbulent depths. A few have heard hollow noises that announced some struggle of the elements far below. Others have hauled in volcanic ash hurled above the waves. As far as the equator, this whole seafloor is still under construction by plutonic forces. And in some remote epoch, built up by volcanic disgorgings and excessive layers of lava, who knows whether the peaks of these fire-belching mountains may reappear above the surface of the Atlantic. As I mused in this way, trying to establish in my memory every detail of this impressive landscape, Captain Nemo was leaning his elbows on a moss-covered monument, motionless as if petrified in some mute trance. Was he dreaming of those lost generations, asking them for the secret of human destiny? Was it here that this strange man came to revive himself, basking in historical memories, relieving that bygone life, he who had no desire for our modern one? I would have given anything to know his thoughts, to share them, understand them. We stayed in this place an entire hour, contemplating its vast plains in the lava's glow, which sometimes took on a startling intensity. Inner boilings sent quick shivers running through the mountain's crust. Noises from deep underneath, clearly transmitted by the liquid medium, reverberated with majestic amplitude. Just then the moon appeared for an instant through the watery mass, casting a few pale rays over this submerged continent. It was only a fleeting glimmer, but its effect was indescribable. The captain stood up and took one last look at these immense plains. Then his hand signaled me to follow him. We went swiftly down the mountain. Once past the petrified forest, I could see the Nautilus beacon twinkling like a star. The captain walked straight toward it, and we were back on board just as the first glimmers of dawn were whitening the surface of the ocean. End of chapter 33 A Lost Continent Recording by Filippo Joachim